Copyright 2014 by Samantha Price. All rights reserved. Chapter 1 Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Psalm chapter 36 verse 5 Emma held her head in her hands, and wondered if Will was having another one of his jokes. She looked up to see that he was still smiling at her. It had to be true, she considered, otherwise he surely would have said so by now. Will, you can't just go and buy a house without me looking at it too. She stared into his face hoping he'd say that it wasn't the case. Maybe he'd only put some kind of holding deposit on it. They hadn't even had many conversations about buying a house. His smile quickly turned into a frown. I thought you'd be pleased. You said that you wanted an old house that we could fix up together. When she made no comment, he continued, it's just as you said you wanted. It's on the outskirts, on the border of the Amish settlement. Once again, a smile broke out on his handsome face despite Emma's disapproval. It's got electricity coming into the house, but I can easily have that removed. It does need a lot of work, I'll admit that, but I can fix it in no time flat. Emma could not contain a heavy sigh as her hands moved from her head to her stomach. She did not want to dampen his enthusiasm, but she was stunned by his impulsiveness. You were to do the looking, and then we were going to buy it together, remember? He stared at her and said nothing. At that moment, Emma thought that maybe they hadn't discussed it as well as they should have, and swiftly added, Well, that's how I assumed we would do it. That's how Levi, her late husband, and she would have done things. Levi would never have bought a house without them both agreeing on it. Will was different from Levi. Will's head was in the clouds and he always acted first and thought about things later. Will laughed away her anger. He put both hands on her shoulders and looked her in the eyes. Come and see it before you get angry with me. You'll love it too. How did you even get the money to buy it? We haven't spoken about our finances together. Does one of us have to sell? Emma did not want to sell her farm or her house. Levi had built the house and it was filled with treasured memories, which she was not going to let go of easily. Realistically, Emma knew she might have to sell one day in order to move on in her new life with Will. As Will was taking his time to answer her question, Emma continued, You know I live on the lease money that Bob Pluver pays for using my land for his crops. That's the only income I've got. Emma was certain that Will's adjoining farm, which he also leased out to Bob, was his only source of income as well since he didn't have a regular job. We'll figure out the finances later. I've got enough money to cover everything, for now. It was the for now comment that worried Emma. They were still two months away from being married, she felt that she could not be so bold as to inquire into his personal finances. I would have thought we might wait to buy a house until after we were married, when we'd talked through and planned our finances together. He made a dismissive sound from the back of his throat. Don't worry so much, Emma. It'll be fine, you'll love the house. Emma raised her eyebrows. Have you just baked cookies? Will followed his nose to the kitchen, leaving Emma standing by herself in her living room. And that was that. Emma knew that as far as Will was concerned, that was the end of the conversation of purchasing the house, and the end of the conversation of their combined finances. Dragging her feet, Emma followed Will into the kitchen. She could not wait to meet the widows tonight to tell them the latest thing that Will had done. No doubt they would be as shocked as she. Mostly, it was Wednesday nights that the widows gathered in the two elderly Shweshida's house, Elsa May and Eddie. Later that night, everyone was there including the younger widows, Maureen and Sylvie. How are things going with Sabrina? Maureen asked Sylvie before she bit into a chocolate cookie. Sabrina was Sylvie's spoiled younger sister who had come to live with Sylvie from Ohio. She's going out a lot now. This time I make sure I know where she's going. She's got a job at the horse auctions doing paperwork. She was always good at adding up and the like. That should keep her out of trouble, Eddie said. For now most likely not for long, Elsa May added without looking up from her knitting. Maureen looked across the room to Emma. You're quiet tonight, Emma. I'm in shock, that's all. The widows all looked at her. Well, you remember how I said that Will's been looking for a house for us? The widows nodded. 
He bought one without me even seeing it. Emma looked at them to see what their reaction would be. Maybe she was being too harsh on Will. The widows were all sensible ladies, and they would know what would be considered rational behavior. Their mouths fell open. The only one who was not shocked was Sylvie. You're not happy about it? Sylvie asked. Emma shook her head. Nay, I'm not happy about it. I'll have to go and live in a house that I had no say in. I think it's a lovely thing of will to do. You should be pleased that he has taken control like a proper man should, Sylvie said with a distinct nod of her head. I'd be glad if Bailey joined the community and bought a house for me. I wouldn't care that I hadn't seen it. I don't mean to seem ungrateful, but we haven't even discussed finances. Where's the money going to come from? Emma chewed on a fingernail. Eddie brought her teacup to her lips, took a sip and then said, Where do you think the money could possibly come from? That's just it, I don't know. One of us might have to sell one of our farms, I guess. Emma could think of no other way to get such a large sum. Didn't you ask him about the money side of things? Maureen asked. Emma shook her head. He's so frustrating sometimes. He just dismissed my questions and ate cookies. Emma took a deep breath. I don't like to talk behind his back. Nonsense, Elsa May said, that's what these meetings are for. We all help each other, and how can we do that if you keep things to yourself? Emma nodded. It's just that I don't want to sell my house, the house that Levi built. I mean I would if I had to, but Will won't even discuss financial matters. It's like he takes no thought for anything and expects things to fall into place with no planning. I get my income from leasing the farm, it's not a great deal but it's enough to keep me. Sylvie, who was sitting next to Emma, stroked her shoulder. And you like to plan things ahead? Yeah, of course. It's a big thing, it's not like buying a spade or a broom. Seems as though you two have very different ways of doing things, Eddie said. It frustrates me so. I mean, I do love him but I wish he could be more. Emma stopped herself just in time. She wished he could be more like Levi. A hush swept over the room. Emma looked at each widow in turn. She could see from their faces that they knew what she had been about to say. The silence was broken by Sylvie, you do love him still, don't you? Yeah, of course I love him. I do, Emma said. Maybe she had been so long by herself that she had trouble letting go of things. Why couldn't she be more like dear kind-hearted and sweet Sylvie? Elsa May moved uncomfortably in her seat and continued knitting the pale yellow blanket for yet another of her great grosskinner which was on the way into the world. I mean, the date is set, the bishop has published our wedding and? Emma's voice trailed away. And all that. I've everything done except the dresses and organizing the food. I'll help with the dresses, Emma. I can have them done in no time, Maureen said. Danka, Maureen. I've already made Will's suit and the suits of his attendants. Emma could feel Eddie's eyes boring into her. She looked up and caught her eye. What's the matter, Eddie? You're a long time married, Emma. Our other sister, Virginia, was betrothed to a man, and she changed her mind the day before the wedding. Elsa May and I were teens, and the day of the wedding. Elsa May and I had to stand there at the front gate and turn everyone away. Elsa May looked up from over her knitting, shook her head and said to her sister, A year later Virginia married the same man. What's your point, Eddie? Eddie glared at Elsa May and pressed her lips firmly together, tiny little wrinkles appearing deeper around her mouth. Maureen came to Eddie's rescue. I think Eddie's trying to make the point that you shouldn't feel obligated, Emma. Just because things have been organized, it's no reason to think that you should go through with it if your heart is not in it. Eddie nodded in agreement with Maureen's explanation. On the other hand, Maureen continued, a lot of marriages work well when the two hardly know each other to start with and you and Will genuinely have strong feelings. You just have to iron out a few small differences. I'm sure that's all it is. Emma felt confronted. She did love Will. Every relationship has teething problems, she reminded herself. Things weren't perfect with Levi from the beginning either. Nay, I do love him. She looked at Eddie and distinctly saw her raise her eyebrows. Do you think that Will is not a good match for me, Eddie? 
Before Eddie could speak, Elsa May said, Don't listen to others. It's what you think of Will, Emma. If you are truly in love with him, deep in your heart, it does not matter what others think. Marriages work whether people are in love or not, Maureen said, making exactly the same point she'd already made moments before. You don't need a man, Emma. I haven't had one for years and I'm perfectly happy, Eddie said. When you're married, you have to compromise. Eddie shrugged her shoulders. But when you aren't married, you can do as you please. You can be as free as the wind, as free as a bird soaring in the sky. I'm not getting married to Will because I feel the need to have a man, Eddie. Aren't you? Straight after Levi died, you and Will were secretly courting. Emma's mouth fell open in shock, and the other widows gasped at Eddie's words. Emma was not sure in what way she should reply. Eddie, everyone needs someone. But sometimes, I think that love is overrated. I've seen many happy marriages where the couple had hardly known each other before they married, Maureen said. So you've said before, Maureen, Eddie said. Are you referring to Bob? Maureen gave a surprised laugh. Nay, I'm just saying. I'm not referring to anyone. Maureen looked at her hands in her lap, then reached over and took a piece of chocolate fudge off the tray of goodies on the low table in front of her. Emma realized she was chewing on her nails and put her hand in her lap. I do love Will. Of course you do, Sylvie said. It must be exciting to have a new house. Have you seen it yet? Tomorrow. Will is taking me there tomorrow. As Emma clip-clopped home in her buggy, she was more confused about her feelings than before the widow's meeting. Emma sighed and said aloud, everyone had such different views on men or in marriage. The cold night air rushed against her face. Chapter 2 I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Psalm chapter 89 verse 1 Will had talked excitedly so much about the house that Emma was expecting something far grander. When he stopped the buggy in front of the driveway, the only thing that came out of Emma's mouth was, This isn't it, is it? Will opened the buggy door and stepped out. Yeah, it's stunning, isn't it? The word Emma would use to describe the house was dilapidated, rather than stunning. It was built over three levels, and it did have a pretty shape. It could look nice with a lot of work, but their plan had been to only change a few things, not to do a full-scale rescue renovation. It's big, I'll say that. Then she looked at the small yard. Where would we put the buggy and keep the horses? It's got land and stables round the back of the house. They look like they haven't been used for a while, but I can soon fix them up. Emma nodded as she thought sarcastically, great, more things to fix. She climbed down from the buggy. Come inside and see, Will said, linking his arm through hers. Emma was pleasantly surprised with the interior. It was not as badly run down on the inside as it was on the outside. It's quite nice. Come and see the kitchen. Will took Emma's hand and walked to the left, through the large living room, through another room until they came to the big kitchen. Emma turned around in a circle. Ah, two living rooms, a formal dining room, and now this huge kitchen. I didn't expect something so large. You wanted a big kitchen, didn't you? I don't think we'll have to do much work in here. We'll have to get rid of the wires and all the electrical things, such as the lighting and the ovens, but that shouldn't take long. Smithy and David are going to help me. Emma nodded, glad that Will had some help. She could not help the twinge of a smile that broke out onto her face as she decided that she would be able to live in the house. It had a homey feel to it, and once she put personal touches to it she just might grow to like it. Will faced her and put his hands on his hips. Well, what do you think? It needs a lot more work than you said it would. She was still mad at him for making the decision by himself, and not including her. Was this how things would be in their marriage? Even though the man was the head of the house, he still had a duty of respect toward the woman, surely that would mean including her in all their major decisions. Are you starting to forgive me a little? Emma raised her eyebrows. Was it possible that he knew how mad she was? She had not said a portion of how she was truly feeling. I'm starting to forgive you a little bit now that I've seen inside it. It's certainly a lot better than the outside. I think we could make it nice. 
Will laughed and closed the distance between them and took her in his arms. I know you're a little cross with me for being impulsive. I know how you like to plan things and organize things to death. I just wanted to surprise you. Everyone needs a little excitement now and again. As far as Emma was concerned, she'd had plenty of excitement over the past months. I was concerned with the finances. I would have thought that before we made a huge purchase like this, we would have sat down and worked out how much we both had and where the money was going to come from. Will threw his head back. I told you before, Emma, I've got plenty of money. Enough for a house like this? Even though it's run down on the outside, it must have cost a lot. Don't you need my contribution if it's going to be our house? Nope. Emma breathed out heavily. Does one of us need to sell? Will shook his head. Emma, I have a lot of money. Besides inheriting the farm, I inherited quite a bit of money. I have enough that we don't need to be concerned with money. Emma was a little taken aback. Levi and Will had been best of friends, and Levi had never mentioned that Will was so wealthy, but then again, why would he have had the need to mention it? She wondered what they would both do with their two vacant houses once they finally move into this house. What are you worrying about now, Emma? I bought this for us because I want you to be happy. I'll get this old place fixed up in no time. Before we're married, okay? That's a lot of work to do in so little time. Are you sure you can do it all? I'll do the essential things first to make it livable for us, and the rest I can do after we move in. I insist on giving you money toward the renovations. I've got $20,000 that I've saved, that should make a good start. If you insist, now no more talk of money. He pulled Emma into his hard, muscled chest. She relaxed in his strong arms, pleased that she liked the place. Come on, I'll show you the rest of it. Will held her hand and led her through the house, explaining how he would strip the floors back and what he would do with the cornices and the window frames. He showed her right through the downstairs, through the two living rooms, formal dining room, a large kitchen and a small bathroom at the end of the far living room. The second level was made up of five bedrooms, main with an ensuite bathroom. Before they made their way up more stairs to the uppermost level, Will turned to Emma. We'll have these bedrooms filled up in no time. Who with? Emma frowned, not realizing that he meant that they would have many children. When she caught on to what he meant, she grabbed his arm. Will, you know that Levi and I were married for years and didn't have Kinner. It just didn't happen. What if I'm not able? Emma, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. It would be nice to have Kinner, but I'm just as happy if it's always just you and me. He smiled at Emma and the kindness in his eyes made her heart soften. As she followed him up the stairs, she realized that she had started to build walls up in her heart against Will. She had been looking for reasons why he was not a match with her, instead of looking for reasons why he was a match. There were two rooms in the uppermost level, and they were both full of cobwebs and dirt. Looks like no one has been up here in years, Emma said. The realtor said it was owned by an old lady. I guess she couldn't make it up this extra flight of stairs. It's a large place for one lady to clean by herself. Well, what's that over there? Will looked to where Emma was pointing. They both walked closer to the small wooden box the size of a shoebox. Will picked it up and brushed off some dust. Elaborate brass hinges covered the edges of the box, and the closure on the front side of it was secured with a padlock. What do you think's inside it? Emma asked. No idea. He shook it a little. It's not heavy, but there does seem to be something inside. I'll go and see the realtor tomorrow, and see if he has a forwarding address for the old owner. I'll get it to her, must be something of value in there if it's locked. Although it couldn't have been of too much value, if she didn't think to take it with her. Is it heavy? Will picked it up. Nay, it's fairly light. Bring it downstairs and I'll clean it up. Will was anxious to start the renovations, but he had told Emma that he would stop by the realtor, so he kept his word. He did not want to risk Emma getting upset with him again. He had been warned that women were temperamental sometimes, and Emma had proven that to be true because she did have some mood swings. Her moods did not bother him, he felt it kept him on his toes, although he hadn't expected her initial lack of joy about the new house. 
Maybe she was right, maybe I should have included her in the decision, he thought as he ran a hand through his hair. Half an hour later, Will sat in front of the realtor waiting for information. No, I don't have an address for her, the realtor said as he looked through the file. The realtor looked at Will and adjusted his neat blue tie. Just throw it out, whatever you found people are always leaving things behind. Too lazy to do a proper job of things. Will was not satisfied with the lack of responsibility the realtor showed. All the same, I'd feel better getting it back to her and she can make that decision. Please yourself. Let's see. The realtor looked through the file again. I can give you her name. It's Dorothy Welby. I remember that she said she was moving to Florida, to a retirement home. How is it that you don't have her address? You'd need it, wouldn't you, for contracts and such? She already signed the listing contract, so I didn't need her to sign anything else. I'd say her lawyer would have her address, he'd need to have it for her to sign the final papers. He looked through the file again. Seems I have a post office box address in Florida. He scrambled through some notes. I'll write the name and the post office box down for you. I don't think her lawyer would give you her address, privacy reasons. You can write to her, see if she wants her old things. He wrote out her details and handed the piece of paper to Will. I appreciate it. Will tucked the piece of paper into his pocket. So, it's still all right that I start work on the property even though things haven't been finalized? Will asked. Yeah, that's okay. It's all cash, isn't it? Will nodded. The realtor continued, so it'll be finalized as fast as the lawyers can push it through. Will left the realtor's office and set off to meet his friends back at the house. They were going to help him assess how much work was needed and where they would start. But first, he would take the address of the old lady to Emma. He knew that once she had one thing on her mind she thought of little else. Emma was out in her front garden pulling weeds when Will pulled up in his buggy. He tied up his horse and walked over to her. Here you go, Emma. What is it? The old lady's address. The one who used to own the house. Her name is Dorothy Welby. Danka Will. I'll write to her now, then I'll go to the post office and send the letter by overnight mail. Will smiled at Emma. He was right about her wanting to do things quickly. I'm meeting the men at the house. We'll see what we need to do. Don't worry, I won't make plans for the kitchen until you come and look at it again. What kinds of things will you be doing? We'll need to strip back the floors, patch the ceiling in a couple of places and Smithy is going to get up into the roof to see if we need to replace it. Emma gasped. Didn't you do all that before you bought it? Relax, Emma. It's not much to put a new roof on, I've helped people before many times. You're not having second thoughts about the house, are you? Nay, I do like the house. Emma was more concerned about the money aspect of things than the physical labor it involved. It'll be nice once it's had some work done on it. I knew you'd love it, I just knew it. Emma thought back to what Sylvie had said the night before. Sylvie would have been pleased for someone to buy her a house. Maybe she was being uncaring. Will bought the house to be nice, he didn't do it to cause her worry or concern. Danka, Will for the house I mean, it was a nice surprise. I'm not much used to surprises, so it took me a little while to get used to the fact that we've got a new house all of a sudden. Chapter 3 Wherefore if God so clothe the grass of the field which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith! Matthew chapter 6 verse 30 A week and a half went by after Emma had posted the letter to Dorothy Welby by fast delivery, and they had not heard anything back. Will and Emma stood looking at the mysterious locked box, which now took center place on the kitchen table in the new house. Stop worrying about the box so much, Emma, Will said. Emma ran a finger over the top of the box. There must be something precious in it, if there's a lock on it. Perhaps if we open it, we can find out if there's anything in there that someone would be concerned about leaving behind. It could be nothing at all. Emma swallowed hard trying not to feel guilty at just the thought of opening someone else's box, particularly when that box was locked. Do you think we should open it? 
Don't see why not. We tried to contact the owner, didn't we? Okay. Emma nodded to Will. I'll get a screwdriver. I should be able to undo these hinges rather than risk destroying the box. Emma waited for Will to return with a screwdriver. Minutes later the box was open. These are old letters, Emma said as she picked up the letter on top. See, nothing valuable in there at all. Will picked up a letter, held it in the air and turned it over. Just some musty old decaying letters. Emma unfolded one of the pages and read the first few lines of the letter. Nay, Will. They are valuable to someone. These are love letters, beautifully written love letters. She looked into Will's eyes as tingles traveled through her body. They've been treasured and kept safe in this box. Will took a letter and sat in the chair next to Emma and started reading. After they both read some letters, Will said, These are letters written to the old lady who used to own the house, Dorothy Welby. Yeah, written to her from someone called Harold. Emma flipped over an envelope to read the return address. Harold Fielding, and I can't see from where they've been sent. Can you tell? I think that Harold Fielding was posted overseas in World War II. I'm sure Field Post Office means that the letters were sent to a central place then sent home from there. By the yellowing of the paper, it seems to fit with the time frame. And she lived alone. I wonder if he ever came back from the war. Emma pressed the letter to her heart as she thought of the horrible losses that war brought into people's lives. Will lowered his head. A terrible thing, war. Yeah, Emma said as she sniffed and wiped away a tear. She had been far more emotional since Levi's death than she'd ever been before. Well, what do you want to do, Emma? How badly do you want to find this woman? I think she would like to have these letters back. We'll keep trying to track her down then. Sounds like she's changed her post office box. I'll do my best to find the correct address for you tomorrow. Emma nodded. Danka. Please see what you can do. Some afternoons, Emma traveled into town and met Sylvie after work. Sylvie worked in a bakery cafe, and it was there that the two would sit, drink cafe, and chat about life. Did you like the house? Sylvie asked when she sat down at the table where Emma had been waiting for her. Yeah, it would have been grand in its day. Will's over there now pulling out all the electrical wires. It needs quite a bit of work. You should come past and take a look. I will, I'd love to see it. One of Sylvie's colleagues placed their order of two coffees and two donuts in front of them. Emma ran her fingertip around the top of her coffee cup. I think you were right. I think it was you who said the other night that Will and I do things differently. I like to plan, and he likes just to go ahead and do things. And that doesn't mean that the two of you aren't suited. In fact, it could be a very good match. He can influence you to be a little less cautious, and you can influence him to think more before he does things, Sylvie said. I guess so. Emma swirled the froth of her cappuccino with her spoon and tried not to think of how her late husband Levi would have done things. She looked up to see Sylvie biting into a pink ice donut. Have you heard from Bailey? Sylvie smiled and finished her mouthful. He said that he would come and join our community in six months. Ah, Sylvie, that's wonderbar. Sylvie waved a hand in the air. I'm not believing it, though, until it happens. What about the case he's been working on, is it solved? Emma asked. Sylvie shook her head and brushed the sugar crumbs away from her mouth. He said that whether it's solved or not, that he'll come back to me and the community. Emma giggled a little and said, maybe we should see if Eddie and Elsa May will help him solve the case. Emma, that's a good idea. I don't know why I didn't think of it before. I was joking, Sylvie. It wouldn't be a good idea. Yeah, it is, I'll ask him. Nay, don't, Sylvie. Bailey's a professional agent with years of experience with access to confidential information. He'd be a lot better at solving crimes than a couple of old Amish ladies who've rarely left Lancaster County. It's never been just a couple of old Amish ladies, it's all of us, you, me, Maureen and Detective Crowley. We're a really good team. Emma's shoulders slouched and she let out a deep breath. Why couldn't she have kept quiet? Bailey might be offended if you mention it to him, after all he's been on the case for years. What do you mean? 
Sylvie's clear blue eyes fastened onto Emma. Emma adjusted her prayer cap and wondered how to phrase what she was trying to say. I mean, if you say that you think that we can solve it, he might think that you see him as not a very good detective. Sylvie slumped back in her chair. Ah, I see what you mean. I will have to be tactful. Yeah, or not mention it at all, Emma thought, but she could see that Sylvie was determined to go ahead with her plan. I'll take your advice, Emma. I'll think on things for a while before I mention it to Bailey or the other widows. Emma nodded, glad that she would not be drawn into something else, she had enough happening with Will in the new house. Emma filled up the rest of their time together telling Sylvie about the new house and the strange box that they had found. Later that night, when the widows gathered in Elsa May and Eddie's home, Emma told them of the box of letters. I could find out where she lives easy as pie. Leave it to me, Eddie said. You could, Eddie. That would be Wonderbar. Don't you have the address, Emma? Maureen asked. Nay, I just have a post office box, that's all. You said she lives in Florida? Maureen asked. Yeah, Emma answered. Maureen leaned forward, her mouth forming a grin. Emma, why don't we go to Florida and take the letters with us? Emma smiled. She would love to have an adventure and travel somewhere. I'd like to, but it's so close to the wedding and Will's working on the house. I'll take over the sewing from Maureen, Sylvie said. Maureen turned to Sylvie. Danka, Sylvie. I've a fair amount already finished. Elsa May said, leave a list of things that Eddie and I can do for you too. Emma wondered if she should go. It was all very last minute. It was something that Will would do, to go somewhere on the spur of the moment. I've never been to Florida, Emma said, her eyes glazed over, wondering if this was a good idea or not. I've been to Pinecraft with my parents when I was young, Maureen said. So did I, Sylvie said. Go on do it, Eddie said, have an adventure before you get married. Emma chewed a fingernail. I'll have to see if Will won't mind. He'll be busy with the house fixing it up, won't he? Elsa May asked. The ladies were interrupted by a knock on the door. Elsa May opened the door and Detective Crowley walked in with three large glass bowls in his hands. Detective, this is a nice surprise. To what do we owe the pleasure? Has someone been murdered? Elsa May asked. The detective laughed, not lately, not that I know of. I was in the area and thought I'd bring back Eddie's empty containers. Elsa May took the bowls from him. Have a cup of tea while you're here and something to eat. The detective greeted the ladies and said, Eddie was kind enough to make me some dinners. She thinks I'm going to starve without a wife. The detective sat down amidst giggles from the ladies. Have you all been keeping out of trouble? Emma's found some old wartime love letters, Sylvie said with a glint in her eye. The detective immediately looked at Emma. Emma's heart raced. Why did Sylvie have to say that? Now she would have to speak to him. She cleared her throat. Yes, I found them in an old house that Will just bought. Although, we don't have an address to get them to the old owner yet. I can find that out for you, he said. You can? Maureen asked. Of course, I am a detective. The detective looked away from Maureen and back to Emma. You say Will bought a house? Emma nodded and said, Thank you, detective, it would be good of you to find where the lady lives now. All we've been able to find out is that she lives somewhere in Florida. I've only her post office box number. I'll drop her address by your place tomorrow, Emma, since you don't have a phone. Emma shook her head. No, I'll go by your office in the afternoon to save you the drive. Very well, suit yourself, the detective said. Sylvie said. Maureen and Emma are going to go to Florida to take the letters to the old lady. The detective chuckled. It's a bit of a stretch for the horse, isn't it? If the detective had not just offered to do her a special favor, Emma would have been a little annoyed at his attempt at humor. We can travel, you know. We just can't drive ourselves anywhere. We can go on buses and trains, but our bishop will not let us travel by plane, Eddie said. Although, my old dad used to say that if God had wanted us to fly, he would have given us wings. Eddie giggled. Elsa May handed the detective a cup of tea. 
After he took a sip, he said, Will bought a house, you say, Emma. What was wrong with his old one? Emma glanced at Sylvie, hoping she was not going to open her mouth and reveal yet more of her personal information. Emma knew she would have to speak fast to avoid Sylvie doing so. We're due to get married soon, and Will bought us a house for us to live in together. For some reason, Emma felt the awkward need to explain further. You see, we did not know which house to live in, mine or Will's, so Will bought another house. Must be made of money, he said in a low voice, his face expressionless. Emma did not take offense at his sarcasm. She was sure he wanted to get under her skin. Yes, he's made of money. Money is not a problem to him. Emma said that it needs a lot of work, Sylvie said. At that point, Emma gave up. She was a private person and did not want the detective to know all her personal information that Sylvie was giving out so freely. Emma knew she should not mind what the detective thought of her, but because of Sylvie's prattling, Emma felt the need to add, it's going to be a nice house when it's finished. Emma was thankful that Eddie changed the subject by saying to the detective, I've got some more meals in the cold box for you. Eddie, I appreciate it, but it's not necessary. I have learned to cook over the years. Eddie scrunched up her face at Detective Crowley, as if she did not believe that he could cook. I like having someone to cook for, and Elsa May and I always have so much left over. It's true, Elsa May said. The detective reached for a chocolate fudge bar and took a bite. While he was chewing, he looked around at the ladies who all had their gaze fastened onto him. I'm sorry, I'm keeping you ladies from your secret meeting, aren't I? He raised his half-eaten chocolate bar. One more of these and I'll go. Eddie rose to her feet. I'll get those meals ready for you. Emma tried not to smile. No one had made an effort to be polite and asked the detective to stay. He was right, they could not speak freely while he was there and it was, after all, a widow's meeting. After Eddie closed the door on the detective, she sat back down on the rickety wooden chair. Well, Emma, you can get the address from the detective tomorrow. He'll be able to get it quicker than I could. Let me know if you need my help with anything else. Danka, Eddie, we might still need your help with something. Eddie nodded. No doubt. Maureen clapped her hands together. I'm excited to go to Florida. Me too, said Emma. Chapter 4 And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Luke chapter 5 verse 20 Going to Crowley's office had not been as bad as Emma had expected, since he'd been called out on a case and wasn't there. He had left Dorothy Welby's home address for Emma at the front desk. Emma saw that the old lady did live in Florida, just as the realtor had told them. She went straight to Maureen's house. Maureen was in her buggy, just about to drive to work. I can talk for five minutes then I'll have to leave otherwise I'll be late. Did you get the address from Crowley? Emma nodded. I did, and she does live in Florida. When do you want to leave? It's up to you, Emma, but if we decide now, I can let them know at work what days I won't be able to work. I guess the sooner we go, the sooner we get back. I'm just thinking of getting back to all the wedding preparations, Emma said. Okay. Shall we go by bus or train? It's a long trip, isn't it? Emma grimaced. Maureen nodded. About a day on the train. If it's going to take that long, sounds like a train would be more comfortable than a bus. Emma considered there would be more room to move about on a train, rather than sit in a cramped seat for nearly a day or over a day. Let's go the day after tomorrow then, that would be Saturday. Emma nodded. I'll get the tickets organized. Denka, Maureen. I'm getting excited. I'll go to the new house now to get the box and I'll take it home with me. Did you read all the letters? I read some of the letters, but when I realized they were all love letters from the one man, it seemed too private to read further. Maureen nodded. Yeah, I understand. I hope the old lady wants her old letters. It'd be a shame to go all that way to find that she didn't want to take the letters with her. Something tells me she will want the letters. They were so touching and so beautiful. Well, I'll let you get to work, Maureen. Two days later, 
Maureen and Emma were sitting on the train headed for Florida. I'm hungry. I've pre-booked us into the dining car so we can have a nice meal. Maureen said. Sounds good, let's go. The ladies stood up, and both adjusted their over-aprons and prayer caps before they made their way down the aisle. I'll just duck into the ladies' room, Emma said, noticing the sign pointing to the ladies' room to her left. No sooner had she stepped through the doorway, about to shut the door than Maureen pushed her way in. Maureen, what are you doing? This is a small room. There's only room for one. Maureen put her hands up and signaled for Emma to keep quiet. I've just seen an old beau. I would die if he saw me. Nay, that's awful. Let me open the door a little and have a look at him, Emma said, curious to see what the old beau looked like. Maureen stood in front of the door. Nay, you mustn't. I can't risk him seeing me. A boyfriend after your husband died, or before you were married? Way before, when I was eighteen. I was going to marry him, but changed my mind just two weeks before the wedding. He's left the community now. You've never mentioned him. I tried to forget him, that's why. He was heading in the direction of the dining car, we can't go there now. Emma made a face, she was hungry and was looking forward to a nice meal. Why not? The price of the meal is included with our tickets. Just say hello and get it over with. Nay, you don't understand, Emma. I don't know what he's likely to do when he sees me. He's strange, truly weird. Emma and Maureen were still cramped in the tiny space. Maureen was a large lady, so there was barely room for the two of them. I've got to go, Maureen. Peep out the door and see if he's gone. I won't be long. Maureen snorted and looked out the door. When she saw that no one was there, she moved slowly into the corridor. Don't be long, she said over her shoulder to Emma. Once Emma joined Maureen, they knew the only thing they could do was go to the cafe, since the dining car was now out of the question. Half an hour later, Emma bit into a toasted sandwich while wondering what the food would be like in the dining car. She tried to take her mind off food by finding out more about the man who had struck fear into Maureen's heart. Tell me about that man you saw just now, Maureen. Maureen gave an exaggerated tremble of her body. His name's David Kingsley. He was brought up Amish, but left just after our wedding didn't go ahead. What was so awful about him? Maureen sucked some chocolate milkshake up through a straw. I was attracted to him at first because he was different. He was always questioning things, but he went too far with it sometimes. He always questioned the Amish way of doing things and always had questions about God. Emma chased down her toasted sandwich with a mouthful of soda. Maureen laughed. One time Ma'am invited the bishop and his wife to dinner, David was there too. David deliberately did disgraceful things. He picked up a whoopie pie from the plate in the center of the table, and ate the cream out of the middle and then put the crust back. He knew everyone was watching him, and he did it another three times. No one said anything, and everyone just looked at him. Emma giggled, she could not picture anyone doing what she had just described. It wasn't funny at the time, but I can see the funny side of it now. Can you imagine how my mother felt? She was trying to have a lovely dinner with guests. I'm sure it wasn't funny while it was happening. That's not all he did that night. He picked up a spoon, stared at it, turned it over and over, and then he started talking to it. Emma grimaced. Sounds like an odd one, all right. I can't see him. I can't. I mean, I can't let him see me. I especially can't let him know that I'm widowed. If we do happen to bump into him, we must pretend that I'm married." Emma nodded and tried to keep the smile off her face. It's hard to know how he'd react. He might be all right, but he might want to get to know me all over again. He must have taken it badly when you didn't go ahead with the marriage, Emma said. Yeah, he left the community. I heard that he married someone, and then I heard that he left the poor woman and was living overseas somewhere. I also heard he was doing certain illegal things. I had no idea that you were ever involved with someone else. I always assumed that Paul was the only man you had been interested in, Emma said. Nay, I was dating David before Paul, and before David there was another man but we only went on a few buggy rides, it was nothing serious. 
So tell me what attracted you to David again. Maureen shook her head. It's too awful to speak about. I suppose your parents were relieved when you didn't go through with the wedding? They were delighted, especially my mother. She kept saying to me as the wedding drew closer, it's still not too late to change your mind. Emma thought she knew Maureen quite well, but now she was seeing a different side of her. How did you know that it was right when you met Paul? I didn't know at first. I thought he was handsome, he was very tall and had a solid build. Maureen laughed. I didn't want a small man. I wanted one bigger than me. We talked one day after a singing. We liked the same things and we laughed at the same things. It just felt right. Maureen squeezed the straw in her drink. Why do you ask? You must know what it feels like to be in love since you've been in love twice. That's just it, Maureen. I'm confused. Will and Levi are so different. I can't help but compare the two constantly, and I don't want to compare them. Will scares me a little because he is so vague and forgetful. I fear he might not be as dependable as Levi was. Then I think that maybe I'm not being fair to Will expecting him to be like Levi. Emma looked at Maureen, hoping Maureen would be able to give her some insight into her feelings about Will. You do love Will, don't you? Yeah, I do. Emma rubbed the back of her neck. Forget I said anything. Maureen reached her hand across the small table and touched Emma's hand. Are you having doubts? Emma shrugged her shoulders, I don't know what I'm having. Why did you buy a house together, and why do you need to marry so soon if you are feeling like this? Emma rolled her eyes. The house. See? He didn't even ask me about the house, he just went out and bought it. What if I didn't like it? Maureen tilted her head. And then you think that Levi wouldn't have done things like that? Emma nodded. You have to remember that he's not Levi, and no one will ever be Levi. Will is Will and only you can decide if you want to be with Will for the rest of your life. Can you stop comparing him to Levi? Emma put her elbow on the table and her hand to her forehead. I don't know, I just don't know. After they finished their toasted sandwiches, they both ordered chocolate ice cream sundaes. They looked at each other and smiled. I feel a bit naughty for some reason. I haven't been away from the community in so long, I can't even remember. I think the change will do us both some good, Emma said, then tried to steer the conversation away from herself. How's work going, Maureen? Yeah, it's going well, but I'm thinking of doing something a little different. It's hard work doing the cleaning, and the different shifts are awkward. I'd rather go and do a day's work rather than a few hours here and a few hours there. Often I do a few hours in the morning and have to go back that afternoon to do another few hours. What have you been thinking of doing? I'm not sure yet. I've thought about opening a little bakery, but there seems to be so many of them nowadays. Perhaps you could specialize in something then. Do something that the others don't do very well. That's an idea, but it'd take money. Maybe you could take on a partner. Like me. As soon as she said it, Emma realized that she no longer had her nest egg. She had given it to Will to renovate their house. Really? You'd be interested in something like that? After I'm married, of course. I'd like to do something. Will always keeps himself busy with things and going from my past history, I won't be having bopless anytime soon. Emma wondered how long it would take her to save that same amount of money all over again. Let's speak more about it after your wedding. We'll both dream up some ideas. Emma nodded. Sounds good but I won't think about it too much because I'll end up thinking about it more than the wedding. Emma looked at the box on the seat beside her. I wonder if we should have tried to call her first. Did Detective Crowley find a number for her? Emma shrugged her shoulders. I didn't ask him. If he found one, I guess he would have given it to me. Chapter 5 And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John chapter 1 verse 5. Emma lifted her hand and knocked on the door at the address that Crowley had given her. She hoped that the old lady was at home, and more than that she hoped that the old lady still wanted the letters. The door opened, 
and an elderly woman stepped toward them. She was small, neatly dressed, and her white hair was caught up behind her head. Hello. She looked from Emma to Maureen, and then her eyes fell to the box. She gasped and her hands flew to her face. Is that my box? Emma smiled. Yes, it is if you're Dorothy Welby. Yes, I am. You found it in my house and brought it all this way. Before Emma could speak, the lady said, Please come in. Once they walked through the door, Emma placed the box on a low side table, then the three of them sat in armchairs. Thank you for bringing me my box. I was so upset when I realized that I'd left it behind. Tell me, how did you come by it? I bought your house in Lancaster County. My fiancé and I found the box on the upper level. I must apologize to you for opening it. We wanted to see if there was something of value in it, to see if we should keep trying to get in contact with you. We did write to your post office box. I never check my post office box. She looked behind her at the box, then looked at the ladies in front of her. Your fiancé bought my house, you say? Emma nodded. Dorothy frowned. Then I've some bad news for you. I got a call from my lawyer this morning, and he said that my house is still not sold. He said that the contract fell through. I'll tell you the name of the buyer, I wrote it down. Dorothy reached for a notepad on the small table beside her. She placed her reading glasses on her nose, lifted the notepad and held it close in front of her. The lawyer said that the buyer was William Joseph Jacobson, and the sale did not go through because of no funding. Emma felt sick to the stomach. Fell through why? How did it fall through? You didn't know. Dorothy looked over the top of her glasses. No, we came up by train and left my fiancé back in Lancaster County working on the house. Oh dear, I'm sorry to give you bad news, my dear. Especially when you've delivered my box back to me. What work is he doing on the house? I hope he hasn't spent too much money on it. Emma shrugged. I'll have to call him and see what's happening. Stay for morning tea, won't you? Yes, you must. Before they could say another word, Dorothy had disappeared into the kitchen. Maureen whispered to Emma, Don't worry, put it out of your mind and we'll call Will when we get back to the hotel. Emma nodded and did her best to push the whole thing out of her mind while they were with Dorothy. They sat and drank tea with the elderly lady in the tiny living room of her house in the retirement village. As Dorothy offered a plate of cookies to the ladies, she said, I can't tell you how much those letters mean to me. I'm so grateful to you both. She looked at Emma. I do hope I didn't leave the house in too bad a state. It got too hard for me to clean, and the house was far too big for me. It was fine. Will, my fiancé, had planned to do a few things to it. In an effort to drive the whole house situation out of her mind, Emma asked, If you don't mind me asking, whatever happened to Harold? Did you marry him? Emma's hand flew to her mouth. Oh, I'm sorry, I did read one or two letters. The old lady sat back deeply into her chair. He just disappeared, missing in action. His name never appeared as dead. They told me that he was missing, presumed dead. Anyway, that's what they said when I pressed them for an answer. Have you done any recent checks on him since that time? Electoral rolls, driver's license and the like? Maureen asked. The old lady did not answer for a while. No, and I'll tell you why. He knew where to find me. We bought that house together as a promise that he'd come back to me. I waited and waited, and he never came back. Dorothy inhaled deeply and let it out slowly as if trying to calm herself. Do you know what it does to a person to wait like that? Emma and Maureen shook their heads under Dorothy's green-eyed gaze. I don't know which would be worse, to know that he was alive and never bothered to come back to me, or to find out that he was killed in the war. You lived in the same house all those years? The house in Lancaster County? Maureen asked. Dorothy shook her head. We lived in Brooklyn. Our plan was that after the war, we would get married and settle in that house in Lancaster. We bought the house and put it in my name in case he didn't make it back from the war. I moved there not long after the war ended, and I waited for him there. Dorothy shook her finger at them. Don't think that we were rich or anything, having a big grand house like that. 
That old house needed work back then, all those years ago. Even so, I struggled with the upkeep for years, hoping that one day he'd come and find me there. I'm sorry to hear that, Emma said. All I have of him are the letters. I did have hope, but now I just have the letters. Did he have any family? Maureen asked. Emma looked at Maureen and knew immediately that Maureen intended to find out what became of Dorothy's love. He had a brother who died, that's all. Friends? We only had each other. I did have a girlfriend back then, Josephine Cutter, but she disappeared suddenly as soon as the war ended. One day she was here and the next day she wasn't. We were sharing a flat together, and then I was left to pay the whole amount. I had to move. That seems odd. Yes, it was very odd. I called round to see her parents and they said she'd moved away. They were always very nice to me, but that day they did not want to speak to me at all. They couldn't wait for me to leave. So you lost your best friend and your fiancé. Dorothy nodded and looked up at the ceiling as if she was trying to fight back tears. Did you have far to travel to go and see your best friend's parents that day? Maureen asked. Only ten minutes by bus. Mrs. Welby, do you mind if Emma and I look into things for you to see if we can find your old friend, and maybe what happened to Harold? Oh dear, I don't know what you'd find. She looked over at the box. Is it any trouble for you to look into things? Not at all, we'd love to help, Emma said. If he's alive and has not tried to find me then please don't tell me. I could not cope with the pain. Only tell me if you find a death record. I'd like to know how he died and where he died. Maureen and Emma agreed. Maureen noticed that there was a picture on the mantelpiece of a soldier in uniform. Is that him then? Maureen said, standing to look closer at the photo. The old lady stood up and walked over to the mantel and handed Maureen the photo. That's my Harold. He looks a very nice man. Maureen turned the photo to show Emma. Would you like to hear about him? Without waiting for a response, she said, I will tell you about him. Sit back down, Maureen. Maureen obeyed. Dorothy rubbed her face and looked as though she was deep in thought. Harold, oh yes. He was lost at war, you know, my poor, poor Harold. I miss him so dearly, she said with a croaky voice. We met at a dance before the war started. There were always dances back then, for the wealthy at least. But I got to go because my aunt was wealthy. My aunt's husband, Roy, was a photographer, and he got invited to the most fabulous events. I was allowed to go to a lot of them. What a time that was when dances were held every Saturday night. How did you two find each other at the dance? Emma had never been to a dance and wondered how Englishers socialized. I was standing against the wall while my aunt danced with a man she didn't even know. I was dressed in a full skirt with petticoats, had on my first pair of stilettos and stockings with the seams down the back. Dorothy laughed. I don't even know if you can get stockings like that these days. I don't know if you can, Emma said. Anyway, I thought I looked good and Harold must have thought so too. He was a handsome man and could have asked any girl to dance, but he asked me. I guess he saw me alone and thought I looked nice because he came up and pulled me onto the dance floor, he didn't even ask. Dorothy's eyes sparkled. It sounds romantic, Maureen said. He just whisked me off my feet and pulled me to the floor amongst the other couples. I was shocked at first, too shocked to even speak to him. I remember my face was as bright as a beetroot. But when I saw his smile, I couldn't help but feel happy. He had the most beautiful eyes, blue as the sky in the summertime. When did you eventually speak to him? Emma asked. We hadn't even talked through the first few dances. But then a slower song came on, so he took my hand and walked me off the dance floor. It was more inappropriate to dance with a stranger to a slow song back then. Today no one gives a hoot. But back then people had manners, and if you were a man you courted a woman. Not like it is today at all. People jump into things so quickly today. Dorothy sipped her tea, and then looked at Emma and Maureen. He would say to me, Dorothy, Dorothy, Dorothy. How I love thee, Dorothy. You are a flower, a ray of sun. And you make my world so much more fun. 
You make my world seem new just by standing in my view. Emma could feel herself about to giggle, and she daren't look at Maureen in case she was about to laugh too. That's lovely, Maureen said. You remembered that after all this time? Yes. He wrote me lots of poetry. He said that he loved me, and I believed him. He meant the world to me for so long. He courted me like a full gentleman, and we did everything together after a time. Dorothy took a drink of water. But then the war started, and being of age, of course, he was drafted. Not even a second thought, he just left to serve his country. He told me how he loved and adored me, and even how the minute he got back he would carry me straight to the chapel and marry me. But he left. He left me alone to worry for, who knew how long. Harold was mine, and I could not lose him. The old lady looked across at Emma and Maureen. War's a terrible thing, isn't it? Maureen and Emma nodded in agreement. While he was at war, I wrote him every day and nearly every week I got one back. Every day I worried that he would not come home, and when the war ended he did not come home. I inquired only to be told that he was missing in action. They had to tell me what that meant. That's awful for you, Emma said. I still love him. If only the war hadn't started, we would still be together. The old lady cleared her throat. Listen to me prattling on, thinking of only my woes. You've come all this way, all the way from Lancaster County. You ladies are welcome to stay here if you don't mind sharing a room. I've only got one spare bedroom. No, thank you. That's very kind of you. We're staying at a hotel nearby. Before we go, can you tell us all you know about Harold and your friend Josephine Cutter? Maureen asked. Don't try and find Josephine. I'm hurt that she just up and went away like that, and I see no reason to speak to her. Tell us some background information about Josephine then, just so we get a broad picture of how things were back then. Maureen smiled at Dorothy. They stayed for a while longer at Dorothy's house, and when they got back to their hotel, Maureen headed straight for the telephone in their room. She called Elsa May and Eddie on their forbidden cell phone. It was only a matter of time before the bishop found out about it. It wasn't right and she'd told them that much. Well, she told Eddie. She wasn't brave enough to say it to Elsa May. Elsa May answered. Elsa May, can you have Eddie find out what she can about Harold Fielding and Josephine Cutter? They would have been born in the late or mid-twenties. It seems that Harold has never been listed as killed in the war. He was listed as missing in action, but the old lady has not done any recent checks on him. Emma and I are hoping he's surfaced somewhere. Will do. Now who's the woman you mentioned? Elsa May asked. Josephine Cutter. She's an old friend of Dorothy who disappeared not long after the war ended. Josephine just up and disappeared, she was sharing a small apartment with Dorothy, and Dorothy was left to pay for the apartment on her own. That was before Dorothy moved to Lancaster. To Emma's new house? Elsa May asked. Yes. Dorothy and Harold bought it together, but it was in Dorothy's name in case he never made it back from the war. He would have come there to find her then if he had survived the war, Elsa May said. Exactly, that's why Mrs. Welby doesn't want to know if he's still alive. She said only tell her if he's dead. She wants to know how and where he died. Okay, I'll get Eddie onto things right away and we'll phone you back at the hotel. As Maureen hung up the phone, she hoped that she would not find out any bad news. The dear old lady deserved some good news, but it seemed as if the only news she would be getting was knowledge of where Harold had died. At least her mind would be put to rest. It appeared Emma was thinking along the same lines. I don't see what good can come of this investigation, Maureen. Maybe we should have kept out of the whole thing. It's a far stretch of the imagination to think that he might be alive. He would have come to find her, or she would have heard of him through a friend or relative. Emma sighed. How long do you think it will take Eddie to find something out? Maureen took a deep breath and looked at the digital clock on the bedside table. It's 12.30 now. I reckon she'd have some information for us later this afternoon. Chapter 6 The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. 
John chapter 1 verse 7. Will walked into his barn and wiped the frustration from his face. He sorted through his tools, wondering which ones he should take with him to the new house. The phone rang, and he hoped it was Emma. Hello, he answered. Hello, Mr. Jacobson. I have some troubling news for you. It seems that your bank has declined the transaction. I need to see you. When can you come into the office here? The caller had forgotten to say who he was, but Will recognized him to be the realtor who had sold him the house. Um, I'm free right now if you want me to come there now. Okay, come straight in. All right, I will see you in just a bit. Will replaced the receiver onto the hook. His eyes fell to the ground then he shook his head and rubbed his eyes. He had made a mess of things. He had hoped that the money would be through in time, but it was clear that this time things would not work out for him as they had in the past. He'd often gone out on a limb and things had always come right, this time they hadn't. He looked down at his dusty clothes and knew he would have to change into some clean ones before he went into town. He hurried inside to change, grateful that he already had the buggy hitched and ready to go. Once Will reached the realtor's office, the receptionist led him to the realtor's desk. He sat heavily on the chair behind the desk, not waiting to be asked to have a seat. Hello, Mr. Jacobson. What's this about the bank not putting the money through? I need a few more days. Until you sort it out with your bank, it's best you give me back the keys to the property. The realtor leaned forward and put out his hand. But I've already done so much work to the house. It's already mine, I've done a lot of work on it. And Emma, my fiancé, gave me the money to do renovations while she's on her trip. Why can't I just keep working on the house until I clear things up with the bank? Will knew the only way out of this was to buy time. Mr. Jacobson, I'm just trying to do my job, and I'm not doing my job very well if you have the keys in your possession under these circumstances. I took you at your word that this was a cash transaction, and that's the only reason I let you have the keys early. The realtor whispered, if the boss knows I've already handed the keys to you, I'll be in all sorts of strife. It's not legal. I did it under the counter, on the side. He lifted his eyebrow. Know what I mean? Will remained silent, and the realtor continued, I'll keep it off the market for a while to give you a bit more time, two days. The money is coming, isn't it? Will nodded. Are you sure? I'm sure. Will did his best to sound confident. After two days, I'll have to start actively marketing the house again. I won't stop anyone looking through it if they want to, but I will do my best to stall them. The realtor frowned at Will. Are you borrowing the money? Will shook his head. I won't need to. But it is coming from somewhere, isn't it? Will nodded. I already said it would be there. The realtor typed something into his computer. Will leaned over and tried to see what he typed, but he tilted the screen away from him. Well, that's it, let me know as soon as you've got the money in the bank. Thank you. I'll be in touch. Will said as he stood up. Will knew he should contact Emma directly. He remembered the name of the hotel where she was staying with Maureen, but he decided to wait until she came back, that way she could have a worry-free time away. As he walked back to his buggy, he felt sick to the stomach about Emma's money that he'd already spent. What if the money didn't come through as he'd planned? There was only one thing for it, he'd have to call the company from where he was expecting the money. Half an hour later, back in his barn, Will had finally gotten through to the person with whom he needed to speak. Mr. Jacobson, sorry that you've been given the runaround. I have your plans in front of me. You do? Do you like the concept? Will's heart was beating so fast and heavily that he thought he might have a heart attack. So much was riding on the answer that he was about to hear. I'm afraid that there would not be enough call for us to manufacture the plow. It would be too costly for us. Maybe you could try a smaller firm, we do things on a large scale. It's not the kind of thing we're interested in, people are using machines now for that kind of thing. I know they're using machines, but there's a big movement that's going in the other direction nowadays. People are moving toward organic farming and don't want to use machinery, Will said. That's very true. However, they're still in the minority, 
and it wouldn't be a wise financial move for us to go with your design. As I said, you may try your luck with a smaller company. We'll keep your name and address on file if we may. Certainly go ahead. And thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Jacobson. Will hung up the phone. That was that. He had to tell the realtor that he could not go ahead with the purchase of the house. He would also need to find the words to tell Emma that he not only lost their house, but he had spent a portion of the money that she had given him. Now to call Will. I hope he's near his barn, Emma said. What are you going to say to him, Emma? Remember, no good comes from anger. I'm too numb to be angry, Maureen. That was my money he was renovating the house with, and now it's all wasted if the sale isn't proceeding. Emma called the phone in Will's barn, but there was no answer. She remembered the name of Will's lawyer, so she called him. The lawyer's secretary was not going to give over any information, but relented when Emma said that she was Will's fiancé and was away and could not reach Will. Okay, I'll look up that file. A minute later, the secretary came back to the phone. It seems that Will was expecting money to come through, and it didn't come through in time. Is that all you can tell me? Emma asked. After the secretary had assured Emma that that was all she could tell her, Emma hung up the phone and looked up at Maureen, who was standing over her. They said that Will's money didn't come through. From what? Maureen asked. I don't know. Will won't talk about his finances. He's vaguely told me that he has investments and things. I don't know what they were talking about, what money didn't come through in time. Try calling him again, Maureen said. Emma called Will's phone in the barn once more, hoping he'd be near his barn and this time he answered. Emma, how are you? I'm fine, Will. I've found the old lady who owned the house, and she said that the sale of her house hasn't gone through. What happened? Yeah, I'm sorry about that, Emma. Well, what happened? Emma didn't want apologies, she wanted answers. I thought I was getting money come through but it hasn't come yet. It was the same old vague answers that Will gave her every time regarding money. She had to pin him down. What money and where was it coming from? Will blew out a deep breath. You remember that plow I was working on? Emma could not remember, but knew Will always had several projects that he was working on at the one time. I vaguely remember. Well, I sent the plans off to a company and I was hoping they'd buy the plans from me. Emma closed her eyes and pushed her fingers into her forehead. I don't understand. Has the firm ever suggested that they might give you money for it? Nay, not in so many words, but you don't understand how these things work. I knew someone who sent in a plan for something similar to that same company, and they gave him $300,000 for it. Emma knew nothing about business, but the story sounded totally unrealistic to her. Who was that person, Will? I can't say who, but I distinctly remember someone telling me about it. Emma shook her head. Was Will going to be like Maureen's David? At some point in the future, would she tell someone the story of Will and what he'd done, the man she nearly married? How much of my money have you already spent on the house? Only twelve thousand. Emma clutched at her throat. Only? Well, I could sell some of the timber back. I could see if they'll take the other things back, too. See what you can do. Emma was doing her best to contain her anger. She had given Will $20,000 to renovate the house as her contribution, seeing that she thought that he had bought the house with his money. I'm sorry about your money, Emma. You sound angry, but I'm upset about it, too. Emma was too angry to think of comforting him. We'll talk when I get back. After she finished her call with Will, Emma could scarcely hold back the tears as she relayed the entire story to Maureen. What am I to do, Maureen? What am I to do? Maureen put her arm around Emma's shoulder and gave her a tight squeeze. You'll forget about it while we're here and we'll enjoy ourselves. Now wipe away those tears and we'll have a walk outside in the sunshine. Before Emma answered, she sat and looked around the hotel room. The covers on the twin beds were bright pink, the wallpaper was swirls of green and purple and small ceramic sailing ships were dotted along the walls. Emma missed home. The homes in the community were plain and not fussy at all, 
and the colors were always muted and pale. She knew if she stayed in that hotel room any longer than she had to, she would surely get a headache. Yeah, walk sounds good. Together they stepped out of the hotel room and into the bright Florida sunshine. It was five o'clock when they got back to the hotel. The man on the reception desk of the hotel said, I've got a message for you, Mrs. Kurtzler. Emma took the slip of paper. It read, Call Eddie Smith back. Maureen and Emma walked up one flight of stairs to their room. I can't wait to hear what she's found out. I hope it's not something bad, Maureen said as she pressed the buttons on the telephone. She put the phone on loudspeaker so Emma could hear what Eddie said as well. I'm sorry to say that it's not good news, Maureen, Eddie said. What did you find out? Is he dead? Worse than that, I'm afraid. He's married, or at least he was married. A year after the war ended, we have a marriage record for him and one Miss Cutter. He's alive? Maureen asked. He's alive, and he married Josephine Cutter, Elsa May said. Maureen's mouth fell open as it sunk it that Dorothy's love had married her best friend, the one who had disappeared. She looked at Emma, who was as shocked as she. That's not all, Eddie said. I found a death record for a Josephine Fielding, and no death record for Harold Fielding. Do you have an address for him? Maureen asked. I've got a current address for him, get a pen. Maureen penned the address and hung up the phone. Emma looked over her shoulder. It's not far from where Dorothy lived in Lancaster. I wonder how long he's lived there for. Why did he avoid Dorothy and marry her best friend? It doesn't make sense, not if you've read the letters. It's awful. Dorothy won't want to know that. Let's not tell her just yet, Emma said. Nay, we can't tell her. Let's have Eddie and Elsa may go visit Harold. He might tell them his side of things, Maureen said. Yeah, Maureen. Quick call them back and see if they'll do it. Chapter 7 For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10 Elsa May and Eddie climbed out of the taxi at the address that Eddie had found for Harold Fielding. It was a small house and a man was out the front crouched in the garden, and he rose to his feet as the ladies walked through the low gate. Would you be Mr. Fielding? Eddie asked. He placed his garden fork on the ground and took off his gloves. Yes. Did you once know a Dorothy Welby? The man studied the two ladies in turn. What's this about? We're friends of Dorothy Welby, and she believes that you went missing in the war. I'm sorry, I think you ladies are mistaken. Dorothy Welby is dead, I'm sorry to say. The ladies shook their heads. She's alive and well, two of our friends just visited her yesterday. She's the same Dorothy Welby who you wrote letters to during the war. Harold sat on the front step of his house. I was told she died. He looked up at the two ladies and then said, Give me a minute. After a moment, Harold buried his face in his hands. Elsa May and Eddie looked at each other as they wondered what to do. He took a handkerchief out of his wallet, rubbed his face and then blew his nose. You ladies better come inside. They followed him inside and sat at Harold's kitchen table. She's really alive? He studied the two ladies. They nodded. Is she well? he asked. They nodded again. Who told you she died? Elsa May asked, already guessing the answer. Josephine. The woman you married? Eddie asked, even though they knew that to be the case from the marriage records. Harold stared at them. You knew Josephine? Knew of her, Eddie said. How can it be that she deceived me? I cannot believe that she could have done anything so cruel to another human being. She knew how I grieved for her. Josephine helped me through my grief. I felt I owed her, I owed her my life. I would have taken my own life if Josephine hadn't stopped me. She suggested we marry and I agreed. She's gone now, she died just six months ago. That's how we traced you, through her death certificate, Eddie said. Where is Dorothy now? Does she know where I am? No, she doesn't know anything. She was told that you died, or officially, 
that you were missing in action. Harold nodded and said, I was in a prison camp, but I was freed when the war ended. They didn't release us when they should have. They held on to us longer than they should have. We didn't even know that the war had ended. Thinking about my dear Dorothy was the only thing that got me through. She thinks you were lost in the war and then her friend Josephine Cutter disappeared suddenly, Elsa May said. It was then that she moved to Lancaster, Eddie added. She moved to live into our old house? Harold asked. Eddie nodded. She hoped that you would come and find her there if you ever came back. I never had reason to go by that old house. I assumed that since she had died, and had no family that the old house would have been auctioned by the state. I put it out of my mind. He looked at the two ladies intently. This is all true, is it? It's not one of those reality television programs or someone playing a cruel trick on me, is it? I can assure you we are telling the truth. Dorothy recently moved to a retirement home in Florida. She's very much alive. I must see her. Do you have a phone number for her? He held his heart. My old ticker is playing up. I'm not supposed to travel while well, not on a plane. They took my driver's license from me as well. We've got friends in Florida right now. Our friend Emma bought Dorothy's old house and found your old letters. They went to Florida to take them back to Dorothy. She told them the story about you, and that's why we came looking for you. A smile lit up Harold's face. She kept my letters? Elsa May nodded and patted the old man's hand. She kept them all this time locked in a box. Did she marry? No, she never married. I don't think, did she? Eddie turned to Elsa May. Elsa May shrugged. I don't know. I must see her, Harold said. Eddie and Elsa May looked at each other. They weren't sure whether Dorothy would want to see him going, by what she said to Maureen. Why don't we tell our friends up there that we found you and let them tell Dorothy? The old man nodded. She doesn't know I'm alive? Please. I'm sorry, ladies. This has all been a shock. I hope I didn't appear rude when you arrived here. Not at all, Eddie said. You weren't to know who we were or what we wanted. Why don't you tell us how you met Dorothy? That'll be a long story. I'll make us some coffee or would you prefer tea? Coffee will be fine, Elsa May said. We'll help. When the coffee was ready, they all sat down. Harold blinked back tears and cleared his throat. Well, here's how we met. It was at a dance. Harold relaxed back into the couch. When I walked into the dance hall that night, I wasn't expecting much. Times were hard for me at least, and there was talk of war. We were young and had the need for fun and excitement beyond what we were faced with every day. He paused and the lady saw a sparkle in his eyes. Back then, there were plenty of eager women anxious to get their hands on a husband. I wondered if I might be called up if war broke out. I had to do my duty. He slurped his coffee. Elsa May asked, when did you see her? I didn't at first. Music was playing, and people were milling about, each trying to capture the attention of another. Somehow through all of the chatter, I heard the faintest sound of a giggle. Can you believe that? In a noisy dance hall filled with laughter and music, my ears caught a hint of sweet giggle. I looked around, thinking that I was hearing things. He looked up and smiled at Eddie and Elsa May. He seemed happy to tell them how he met Dorothy. It's lovely to have memories, Eddie said. He continued, I saw her sitting at a table with a lot of people. She wasn't just any girl. She was the prettiest girl I'd ever seen, bright green eyes shining underneath long lashes, she was as pretty as a movie star. One of those Hollywood starlet beauties, you know? They used to call them pin-up girls. Our eyes met as she continued to giggle with her girlfriend. She blushed and I blushed. My friends teased me and pushed me in her direction. I stammered. I didn't know how to speak to such a pretty woman. So what did you do when your friends pushed you toward her? Eddie asked, engrossed in his story. A smile splashed across the old man's face. I panicked, of course. Now mind you, I never had trouble talking to women before but this one, well, she made me nervous. I don't know whether it was her smile or her eyes or her perfectly coiffed blonde hair, 
but she did something to me. All I could muster was a hello. Then I stood there looking like a fool with a silly grin on my face. A hearty laugh escaped his lips. Elsa May asked then what happened. Shrugging his shoulders, he continued, she answered me after she laughed at my awkwardness. I didn't care because at least she didn't shoo me away. We spoke for a few minutes. I don't know what we spoke about exactly. All I can remember is her beauty. I couldn't help but stare into her eyes. They were a shade of green I'd never seen before. Just beautiful and honest looking. Leaning toward the women, he asked, Do you know what I mean? How you can tell someone's a good person by the look in their eyes? I saw that with her. Everything about her, her alabaster skin and her not-so-done-up face told me she was real, authentic. I mean she wasn't all gussied up or looking like she was trying to impress. Swallowing hard, the old man put his hands to his head. Elsa May and Eddie knew that he was lost in the memory of that pretty girl he met at the dance. They sat in silence and waited for him to continue his story. Boy, I'll tell you. That woman made my heart sink into the pit of my stomach. I'd heard people use that expression, but I never experienced it before that night. Every word out of her mouth made my knees weak. My hands shook so hard I had to tuck them into my pockets so she wouldn't see. I'm sure she noticed, but she never said a word about them. I'll never forget the smell of her perfume, it hinted of lavender. Yup, even in a smoke-filled dance hall I could smell her sweet perfume. Every time I smell lavender, I think of her. The two women looked at each other. Did you ask her to dance? Eddie asked. A broad grin preceded another round of hearty laughter before he answered. You bet I did, but I wouldn't call it dancing. It was more of me tripping over my own feet while she pretended I wasn't an idiot. It worked out, though. She didn't leave me standing on the middle of the dance floor. It gave us something to laugh and talk about later. He shook his head. She loved to dance. I loved to try to keep up with her. It gave me an opportunity to take in that sweet lavender scent and hold her tiny frame for a few moments. Eddie asked what happened next. After we danced? The two women nodded. Well, after I nearly broke my ankle and hers on the dance floor, she invited me to her table. Of course her friends and my friends tried to be nonchalant about it, but we could hear their snickering. It didn't matter, though. All I cared about was getting to know her better. Aside from her looks, she really was the sweetest thing and smart, too. That awkward night proved to be one of the best nights of my life. What I wouldn't give to be able to dance with her again. The old man breathed out heavily. I can't wait to see her again, I thought I'd have to wait till I died. Does she have a phone number? I suppose she might, Elsa May said as she looked at Eddie who shrugged her shoulders showing that she wasn't sure. Can you get me her phone number? I'll give you mine but I can see that you ladies are Amish and wouldn't have a phone would you? We can still use a phone, Eddie said, leaving out the information about her secret cell phone. Elsa May sucked in her lips and then said, We haven't told her that you are alive. I'm sorry to say this, but there's a chance she might not want to see you. The smile left Harold's face. I'll have to abide by her decision. Please let me know what she decides as soon as possible. I dare say she won't be happy when she hears I married Josephine. Eddie and Elsa May left Harold's place with his phone number. It must have been a nasty shock for him that Josephine told him that Dorothy had died and then tricked him into marrying her, Eddie said. Elsa May nodded. A terrible shock. Maybe he found out that she was a deceptive kind of person after they'd been married for a time. Maybe. Chapter 8 Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17 Maureen hung up the phone, after Eddie told her the situation from Harold's point of view. Harold had been deceived by Josephine Cutter into thinking that Dorothy was dead. Then he married Josephine, almost out of a sense of gratitude or obligation for her helping him through his grief. How are we going to tell her that? Maureen asked Emma. Should we tell her? She'll be devastated. She did tell us not to tell her if he was alive, 
and hadn't bothered to find her. This is worse than him not trying to find her, isn't it? Emma and Maureen talked about it for a while longer before they decided that Dorothy should know what happened between her friend Josephine and her old beau, Harold. The very next morning, Emma and Maureen knocked on Dorothy's door once more. Come in, come in, Dorothy said when she opened the door and saw them standing there. To what do I owe the pleasure of your company again? Dorothy asked. Can we sit down? Maureen asked. Of course I'll fix us some tea, shall I? I was just about to have some myself. Maureen and Emma sat in the living room and looked at each other. Emma could scarcely stop her fingers from fiddling with the strings of her prayer cap. She hoped that Dorothy would not be too upset at finding out that her best friend had lied to Harold and then married him. When Dorothy appeared with a large serving tray, Maureen helped her carry it to the coffee table. All poor, Maureen said. Thank you, it's not often I'm waited on. Now you two are looking very serious. Do you have bad news for me? I can take it. You don't have to be scared. The old lady brought the teacup to her lips, her eyes flitting between Maureen and Emma. We found Harold, Emma said. Dorothy put the teacup back down on the saucer. Is he dead? Maureen and Emma shook their heads. It's a complicated thing, Maureen started. He is very much alive. He was married, but his wife died recently. He married, but where is he? They told me he was missing. He's living close to Lancaster County. Two of our friends went to visit him yesterday. He told them that he was in a war prison overseas, but he did come back a little time after the war had ended. Dorothy pursed her lips. Why didn't he come and find me? He was told that you had died, Maureen said softly. The old lady's two hands flew to her open mouth. She stared from Maureen to Emma then placed her hands back in her lap. Who told him that, she said, her voice croaky. That's the thing where it gets a little complicated. Maureen threw a sideways glance at Emma. Emma raised her eyebrows and knew that she should be the one to deliver the sad news. After all, she was the one who found the letters and wanted to get them back to their owner. You see, it was your friend, the one who went missing, it was she who told him that you died. The woman called Josephine Cutter. Dorothy pushed herself back into the couch and was silent for a while. How would you know that for sure? Harold said so. I'm afraid that she went on to marry Harold. Dorothy's mouth fell open and her eyebrows rose. Where's Harold now? Lives close to Lancaster County. He's keen to see you if you want to see him, Maureen said. He knows I'm alive now? Maureen nodded. He certainly does. You said that his wife had died. Does that mean that Josephine is dead? Maureen nodded. I'm afraid Josephine died not too long ago. Dorothy's eyes looked into the distance. I always thought that Josephine liked Harold. Harold told me once that she made a play for him. I laughed at him and told him that he must have imagined it. Now it falls into place, but I never thought she would be capable of doing what she did. Do you want to see him? Emma asked. Yes, of course I do. The past must be as water under the bridge. I've little time left for this world, and I'll not bear a grudge for the rest of it. Emma and Maureen nodded. He's not able to travel, he's got a bad heart. You could come back on the train with us if you'd like to see him, Maureen offered. Of course I'd like to see him. When are you going back? Emma said, we plan to go tomorrow but we could stay a little longer if you won't be ready tomorrow. Thank you. I'll be ready for tomorrow. I've waited for this for many years. Dorothy gave a little laugh and clapped her hands together. I can't believe this is happening. Dorothy leaned forward and took both Emma and Maureen's hand. You two ladies are angels. God has sent you to make an old lady happy. I thank you from the depths of my heart for bringing my Harold back to me. If I just see his face before I die, that will make me a happy woman. Early the next morning they called for Dorothy in a taxi and took her to the train station. Once they settled into their train seats, Emma noticed that Maureen was looking around nervously. Don't worry, it's hardly likely that he'll be on the train this time. Maureen laughed and looked down into her hands. What's the matter, Maureen? 
Dorothy asked. Before Maureen could answer, Emma leaned over toward Dorothy who was sitting opposite. When we were traveling on the train to see you, Maureen spotted an old bow on the train. We had to hide from him and couldn't even eat our meal that we had already paid for. It was when Maureen was younger, she canceled her wedding just two weeks before marrying him. Dorothy looked startled and turned to Maureen who was sitting next to her. I thought you Amish would have arranged marriages. Maureen drew her body away from her. No, never. Emma giggled. We have our own choice who we marry. Oh, I'm sorry. So, you're not married, Maureen? I was married, but unfortunately he became very ill for quite a few years before he died. I'm sorry to hear that, Maureen. She looked across at Emma. What about you, Emma? I was married too, and he died about a year ago. Emma's engaged to someone now though, Maureen said with a smile. That's lovely, Dorothy said. Did I tell you that I was once married? Emma and Maureen shot each other a look. No, we didn't know, Maureen said. Yes, it was five years after the war. I knew Harold wasn't coming home, and I met someone I thought was a nice man, but he turned out to be too fond of the whiskey and the women. We only lasted six months together before I filed for a divorce. Dorothy looked out the train window. I never should have married him. I hoped that by marrying someone else it would take the pain of my Harold away. Emma joined Dorothy in looking out the window and wondered whether she was trying to block the pain of losing Levi by marrying Will. The old lady looked back to Emma. Tell me about your fiancé, what's he like? Emma smiled. He makes me happy. He's carefree and makes me feel that I'm young again. He's always so full of energy. Goodness me, Emma, you are young compared to me anyway. Is your man handsome? Emma nodded. Yes, he is tall and quite handsome. Maureen nodded in agreement. Dorothy turned to Maureen. Have you found yourself another man? There is someone I like, but he's very quiet, maybe a little too quiet. Sometimes I don't know what he's thinking, and it unnerves me. In what way? Dorothy asked. It's just that I can't work out if we have things in common, or if we think the same way on things because he never comments. Dorothy took hold of Maureen's arm. Take the advice of an old lady, don't be in a rush. She looked over to Emma. You too, Emma. You can't date someone else, or have a relationship with someone else when you are still in love with someone else, even if they are dead or missing in action, assumed dead. Emma shot a look at Maureen, and they both smiled at each other. Emma was always willing to listen to her elders. When Emma was younger she thought she knew it all, but as she matured she was grateful to listen to advice. Even though Dorothy was not Amish, it did not mean that her advice was of no consequence. Were you talking about Bob Pluver just now, Maureen? Maureen nodded. Emma did not think that Bob was a suitable match for Maureen, and she hoped that Maureen would listen to Dorothy's advice about not rushing in. Tell me, Dorothy, Maureen said with a laugh in her voice, did you ever run into that man you married after you divorced? Dorothy laughed and put a hand to her mouth. Heavens no. I don't know where he's moved. I heard he moved away when I told him to leave the house for the last time. I would cross the other side of the street if I ever saw him walking toward me. So you're divorced now? Emma asked. Dorothy nodded. You can't divorce in your religion, can you? Both Maureen and Emma shook their heads. It always seems that you Amish have an ideal lifestyle. Many of my neighbors were Amish, and they were always so nice and friendly. The children were always so polite. I'd see the children walk by to school as I worked in the garden of a morning. Emma pictured the small front yard of Dorothy's house. It did have a nice garden, or would have been nice once upon a time before Dorothy moved. How do you like living in Florida? Emma asked. I like the weather, it was far too cold in Lancaster County. Now it's warm and sunny all year round. At its coldest, I just need wear a light cardigan and that's all. After a pause, Dorothy said, did I mention I have a son? The ladies shook their heads. A year after I married, I had a son, I called him Harold. He's still living near my old house where he grew up. It must have been hard to leave him when you moved to Florida, Maureen said. 
She shook her head. He's busy now with his own family. He'll visit me, though. I've got a spare bedroom and the children, my two grandchildren, can sleep in the fold-out in the living room. Would you like to stay overnight at my place when we get to Lancaster? We can go and see Harold first thing in the morning, Emma said. Thank you, that would be lovely. You ladies have been so kind. I have to work tomorrow so I'll have to leave you in Emma's hands, Maureen said. Eddie and Elsa May were excited for Harold and Dorothy to meet, so they had invited themselves to Harold's house for the reunion. Emma helped Dorothy out of the taxi. As they walked toward Harold's front door, Dorothy said, I feel as though I'm going to burst. I hope he's not disappointed to see how old I've gotten. Emma laughed. Nonsense, everyone gets old, he's older too and you look lovely. When they were nearly two yards away from the front door, it swung open, and Harold stood in the doorway with a huge smile covering his face. Dorothy walked toward him with outstretched arms. He touched her hands, and then they looked into each other's eyes before they hugged. Emma looked past Harold to see Elsa May and Eddie just inside the house. Eddie wiped a tear away from her eye, and Elsa May smiled sweetly. Once Harold and Dorothy finished their embrace, they looked into each other's eyes once more as their arms locked together. I can't believe it, I just can't believe it, Dorothy said. I don't know what to say, Dorothy. Dorothy looked him up and down. You don't need to say anything, it's so good to see you. Come inside, Harold said. Elsa May and Eddie disappeared back into the house while Emma and Maureen followed. Harold briefly introduced Eddie and Elsa May, and Dorothy introduced Harold to Emma and Maureen. Thank you ladies for doing what you've done. I'm so grateful, you've got no idea what this means to me, Harold said with his arm around Dorothy. Elsa May grunted and said, you two catch up with each other and we'll make the tea. Emma helped the three ladies in the kitchen. I found out that Dorothy was married briefly and has a son. She called her son Harold, and he lives somewhere around these parts. She divorced his father a long time ago, Maureen told Elsa May and Eddie. She most likely never got over Harold, Eddie said. I've been thinking that maybe he, the son, can drive her back to Florida when she's ready, or take her back on the train. She's a bit frail to travel by herself, Maureen said. I wonder how long she'll stay. Elsa May put two teacups onto a tray. How did she take the news that her friend lied then married Harold herself? Eddie poured the boiling water into the teapot. She seemed shocked but she got over it quickly. Surprisingly fast, Emma said. I've told Dorothy that she can stay at my place as long as she wants. I'm guessing she might stay a few days. Elsa May made her way to the living room with a tray of tea and teacups. Eddie and Emma followed with a plate of cookies and some of Elsa May's jam tartlets. Harold and Dorothy sat on the lounge holding hands. Harold looked up at the ladies when they walked in the room. Dorothy's agreed to marry me. Oh, that's delightful news, Emma said as she placed the plate on the coffee table. We're going to live in my new home at the village. There's room for two, Dorothy said. Lovely, Elsa May said. We're so happy for you. Emma was going to ask if she was going to see her son while she was here, but she did not know if Dorothy had mentioned her son to Harold yet. You ladies have been so good to both of us. I don't know how we can ever repay you for your kindness, but we will find a way, won't we, Harold? Most definitely. We'll find a way, Harold said. Emma shook her head. We're happy that you two have found each other again. That's all we need. We should leave you two alone to catch up, Elsa May said. Shall I call for you this afternoon, Dorothy? Around five? Emma asked. No, dear. I'll get a taxi to your house. You can't be running around after me, you've done enough. The widows said goodbye to Dorothy and Harold, and they all left the house at the same time. Chapter 9 Offer the Sacrifices of Righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Psalm chapter 4 verse 5. Later that day, Emma met Sylvie at the bakery cafe where she worked. Sylvie had just finished her shift and was able to sit and talk. You should have seen them, Sylvie. It was as though they'd never been apart. They just took right back up where they'd left off, and now they're going to get married. 
It's so nice to be in love. It's funny how you can be instantly drawn to another person. Did you feel an instant attraction to Bailey? Sylvie nodded. I did. Harold is going back to live in her retirement home with her, Emma said. That was so horrible what her friend did to her. Elsa May told me what happened. Sylvie wrapped her hands around her cafe mug. Emma nodded and took a sip of her hot drink. It was awful all right. I wonder how things would have turned out if her friend had still been alive when she found Harold, I mean, still married to Harold. That's a point. That would have been awkward for everyone involved with the lies that Josephine had told. It's odd how those letters sent you on a big adventure. Especially since the purchase of your house didn't go ahead in the end. It was as if God arranged for you to see the letters and get the two of them back together. I didn't think of it like that. I wonder. Emma wondered if more than that, God was teaching her about love. There was Maureen's ex fiance as well, which caused Emma to look at her relationship with Will in a new light. There were also Dorothy's warnings not to rush into marriage with another man when you're in love with another, as Dorothy herself had done. What are you thinking about, Emma? Ah, uh, sorry. Just thinking on the journey and how life takes different and unexpected turns. Emma ripped open a sachet of sugar and poured it into her cafe. As she stirred her hot drink, she looked around the cafe. Must be nice to get out and meet people like you do. You mean when I'm working here? Sylvie asked. Yeah. I've been thinking I should get a part-time job or do something. Emma had thought of opening a small business, but that was before she gave her nest egg to Will for the house renovations. It is good to get out and meet people. I've made a lot of friends from working here. Did you know many of the people come in every day? Emma nodded. I'm going to think about a job. I've plenty of time on my hands. I could sew quilts like some of the ladies do, but I prefer to do something where I'm amongst people. Sylvie spread butter onto her hot banana bread. You know that Sabrina's got a job now, don't you? I believe you mentioned it, where is she working again? When Sylvie finished her mouthful of banana bread, she said, she's had two jobs, she didn't like either of them, but now she's working at the auction place. She says she likes it. That's good, that'll keep her out of trouble. I'm hoping it will. Sylvie laughed. An hour later, Emma opened the front door of her house. She had no idea what time Dorothy would arrive back, and assumed she might be back around dinnertime that night. She looked into the cold box to see what she could make for dinner. She turned when she heard Growler behind her. Hello, Kitty. What have you done today? When she looked closer at Growler, she saw his paw was bleeding. She looked behind him to see blood had trailed all over the kitchen floor. She bent down. Let me see your paw. Growler would not let her anywhere near his paw. You home, Emma? I'm in the kitchen, Emma said recognizing Will's voice. Will, it's Growler, he's hurt his paw. Will raced to the kitchen and bent down to take a look. Growler was no more interested in letting Will pick up his paw than he was to let Emma pick it up. Will sat on the floor and held Growler against his body and parted the long fur on his leg to see where the bleeding was coming from. It's not too deep a cut. I'll just put some aloe vera on it and it'll be fine. Do you still have that aloe vera plant? Yeah, shall I squeeze out the gel? Yeah, squeeze out about as much as you can cover on two fingers, make it a good dollop. Emma rushed out to the garden and pulled some aloe vera leaves and squeezed out the gel and hurried back to Will. Will took the gel with his two fingers while still holding on to Growler. Good boy, Growler. Will talked to Growler in soothing tones while he pasted the gel on his cut. Growler growled a long slow growl then leapt away from Will. Looks like he's been in a cat fight. Emma watched Growler walk into the living room. Are you sure he's okay, or should I take him to the vet? Yeah, he'll be all right. I'll have to keep him inside for a while. At least until he heals. Will nodded. I'll wash my hands outside. Emma was pleased that Will came just when he had. She was no good in a crisis. She wondered how she would be with Kinner when they got hurt, if she panicked when her cat was bleeding. Will came back in the back door wiping his hands on an old towel. Emma, 
I came to talk to you about something quite serious. What is it? Emma asked. This was the first time they had come face to face after finding out that the sale of the house Will tried to buy had not gone through. I feel terrible about what happened with the house and you losing money. I will pay it all back to you. Emma breathed out slowly and nodded, pleased that she would have the money to go ahead with a small business. I could still buy the house if I borrow against my farm. Nay, Will, don't do that. I will if you want me to. If you love the house. Emma shook her head. It's a nice house, but I feel as though we are best to wait until after we're married before we make a final decision. Didn't you say you had inherited money? Emma did not like to talk about money, but he had mentioned that he had inherited money. Surely he would not have made that up. Will looked down. I've loaned it to people in the community who were in need. He looked back up. You know I can't ask for it back, don't you? Of course I know. Nay, you can't ask for it. Will you live at my house, though, Emma? Or shall I live here? Or do we live separately once we're married, until we have another house? Emma was tired, and all his questions required thinking, and she was far too weary. I really don't know. Can we talk about this later? I'm tired from the big trip I've just had, and I've got to plan dinner for Dorothy. She's coming back here tonight. Emma said goodbye to Will and watched at the door as he walked back to his place. Remembering Growler's blood all over the kitchen floor, she headed back to the kitchen. She grabbed a dish rag, wet it with water, and wiped the floor. She had barely finished when she heard a knock at the door. She hoped it wasn't Dorothy so soon because she hadn't even had a chance to think about dinner. When she opened the door, she was shocked to see Detective Crowley. He jumped back and stared at her. Mrs. Kurtzler, who's dead now? Emma frowned until she realized she had a rag in her hand filled with blood. She laughed and put the rag behind her back. Oh, Growler injured himself somehow. She stepped aside. Come in and have a seat. I'll just get rid of this and wash my hands. Moments later, Emma sat down in the small couch opposite the detective. How can I help you? I believe you have one Dorothy Welby staying here. Emma narrowed her eyes and nodded. Yes, she was the one the letters belonged to, the one Maureen and I went to visit in Florida. Anything wrong? The detective shook his head. Why is it, Emma, that you always land into the middle of things? Emma stared at him, wondering what he was talking about. Mrs. Fielding, who used to go by the name of Josephine Cutter, died in a local hospital. She was there for a simple operation to have her tonsils removed, and she died. There's a risk with all operations, isn't there? Emma raised her eyebrows at the detective's silence. Do you think she was murdered or something? The detective ignored her question and continued, an autopsy was performed, and it was revealed that she was given a lethal dose of insulin. Emma's hand flew to her mouth. The detective continued, Were you aware that Dorothy Welby was once a nurse? I don't think so, I can't remember whether she mentioned that or not. Surely you can't think that Dorothy had anything to do with it. The detective leaned back in his chair. Mr. Fielding was not happy and claimed hospital negligence. I looked into things and asked around. The woman who was sharing the same hospital room as Mrs. Fielding, says she saw an elderly lady around Josephine's bed shortly before she died. Nothing made sense and there were no suspects until now. Emma tilted her head to the side. I'm not following you, detective. What are you saying? I brought up records of Dorothy Welby and found that she matches the description of the lady who was seen over Josephine's bed. Detective, surely all old ladies look the same. There would be thousands upon thousands of women with that same description. An old lady with gray hair of medium build 5 feet 2 inches. How many women would fit that description? She has motive from what you ladies told me of Josephine Fielding's deception. At the time of Mrs. Fielding's death, Dorothy Welby did live close by. Emma said, you mentioned Mrs. Welby's record, does she have a criminal history? The detective shook his head. No, I was speaking of her driver's license record. Detective, Dorothy Welby is a sweet old lady and not capable of doing anything like that. 
When we told her that Harold was alive, she had no idea she was truly shocked. The detective rose to his feet. Of course, that's what impression she would need to have given you. She could not have turned up out of the blue and gone straight to Harold after she'd killed his wife. He shook his head slowly. No. If she did kill Josephine Fielding, she would have gone underground and set about planning a legitimate way that she could be reunited with Harold. Such as, innocently leave a box of letters in her house for some do-gooder to read, and set about to reunite them. Emma thought that maybe the detective had been at the job for far too long, if he thought that everyone was a murderer. Detective, did you just call me a do-gooder? I meant no offense. The old lady needed a cover, a genuine way that she could be reunited with the old man after the wife happened to die. The way I see it, Dorothy knew she'd been seen, and figured there would be an autopsy. She had to lay low, and have everyone think that Josephine had been mistakenly given insulin by one of the hospital staff. Is it a coincidence that a few days after Josephine died that Dorothy moved to Florida? Emma bit her lip and wondered whether there might have been someone else who would have wanted Josephine dead. Detective, are you joking with me? Or is this all true? Emma, I'm not a joking kind of person. I wouldn't joke about something so serious. I went back to question the witness today, but unfortunately she had died. Detective Crowley walked toward the door. Just thought you might like to know who you're entertaining in your house. Emma stood in the doorway and watched the detective walk to his car. Wait. She ran over to him. Are you going to open up the investigation? I mean, are you going to investigate things? The witness is dead. Nothing would stick, and it's not likely she'd confess. Not much point going further, is there? Emma studied the detective's hard face. Maybe he'd been in the job far too long, and had grown to be too suspicious of people. Detective, you really should stop seeing a murderer behind every tree. Detective Crowley looked at Emma for a moment, before he got in his car and drove away. Emma's head started to spin. She had the worry of the sale of the house not going through and her nest egg gone. The last thing she wanted on her mind was the idea that she might be entertaining a murderer. Chapter 10 Offer the Sacrifices of Righteousness And put your trust in the Lord. Psalm chapter 7 verse 1 Emma shelved the ridiculous thing the detective had told her of Dorothy Welby. There was no way that Dorothy would have done what Crowley suggested, Besides, Dorothy did not even know that Harold was still alive. The main worry on Emma's mind was whether she and Will were suited to one another. Sylvie might be able to help her sort through her feelings. Emma left a note on her front door for Dorothy telling her to let herself in, and that she would be back soon. Emma drove to Sylvie's house, which was nearby, and was pleased to find her at home. Once she told Sylvie that she had something to speak to her about, Sylvie and she sat on the couch. Sylvie, I don't know what I'm going to do. Did you hear that our new house has fallen through? Yeah, but I don't know the details. What happened? Emma took a deep breath. I've been trying not to think about it, that's why I didn't mention it to you when we had cafe. I knew you had something on your mind, I could just tell. Emma nodded and continued with her story. Will bought the house without telling me, that was the first thing. Yeah, I know that, Sylvie said. When Maureen and I were away meeting the old lady, she said that the sale of her house did not proceed, and that's the first I learned of it. When I went back to the hotel, I phoned Will, and he said that he was expecting some money to come through from one of his inventions. What do you think about that? Sylvie opened her mouth to speak, but Emma continued, he invented this plow thing and sent plans off to a company and then he expected them to send him a check for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sometimes I wonder whether he's lost his mind. He signed for the house with no money to back it up. Sylvie covered her mouth with her hands and said nothing. It's worse than that. Since I thought that he had paid for the house only because that's what he told me, I said I'd pay for the renovations. I gave him $20,000 for the renovations and he spent a lot of it, so now I've lost money. Emma took a deep breath and stared at Sylvie. I saved hard for that money and now most of it's gone. Wow, Emma, I don't know what to say. Sounds like you've been through quite a bit. Emma wiped a tear away from her cheek. 
I don't know if I can see myself married to him now. Levi would never have done anything so flighty. I can't be with someone who does silly things and takes risks like that. I'm only a simple woman, and just want a simple life. I don't need any grand things. I'm happy how I am. Have you told Will this? Nay, I don't know what to say to him. He knows I'm not happy about the whole thing, and we haven't really spoken of it. I don't want to upset him because I know he means well. You need to speak to him, Emma. You don't have to marry him, you can change your mind, it's not too late. Emma stared at Sylvie, those were the very words that Maureen's mother had used when she was trying to stop Maureen from marrying the man they were hiding from on the train. Was it a sign from God? I know I should speak to him. I just don't know where I would start or what I would say. Sylvie sucked in her cheeks. I don't like talking behind his back like this but I just need advice. I don't know if I'm thinking clearly. You know I'm not a gossip, don't you? Emma asked. Of course I do. I'm not thinking that at all. I'm thinking how hard it must be for you since you were so in love with Levi. It'd be hard for someone else to measure up. Exactly, that's what I'm struggling with. I know I keep comparing him and it's not fair to him. Every time he does something to upset me, I think to myself that Levi would have done things differently, and that's hardly fair to Will. What if it's not about being fair to Will? What if you're just not ready yet? It seems as if there's not an easy answer. I do love him, but I don't know if deep in my heart I can go through with marrying him. Then I think that there will never be anyone for me again, only Levi. I'm so confused. Sounds like you need time to think things through. Did the time away with Maureen help clear your head at all? It might have if I hadn't found out as soon as I got to Dorothy's place that we hadn't bought the house at all. I think I've been in shock. I'd better get home. Danka for listening to me and my troubles. Anytime, I wish I could have been some help to you. When Sylvie closed the door after waving goodbye to Emma, she turned around to see Sabrina. Sabrina, I thought you were at work today. Nay, remember I told you I wasn't working today? I worked yesterday. I can hardly keep track of the days and times I'm working without keeping track of your hours. A smirk covered Sabrina's face. So Emma doesn't like Will? Of course she does, they're betrothed. Sounds to me like she's having a lot of second thoughts about him. It's normal for people to think things like that before they get married. Nothing to worry about. Sylvie pushed past Sabrina and made her way into the kitchen. When I first came here, you told me to stay away from Will because he was in love with Emma. Yeah, he is in love with Emma, and they don't need you trying to come between them. Sounds like she's not too happy about him though, doesn't it? Sabrina, you should not listen in on other people's conversations. None of it concerns you. You knew that I liked Will. You were the one who told me to stay away from him. You do have to stay away. Find someone else, Will and Emma are getting married soon. Sabrina crossed her arms in front of her chest. I've a good mind to tell Will what Emma's running around saying to people about him. Sabrina, don't you dare. If you breathe a word you'll be out of my house in no time flat. Anyway, I thought Carmelo Leonte was the only man you could ever love. Sabrina's mouth fell open. Sylvie, how could you? How could you mention his name? Sabrina's face was red with rage as she stomped into her bedroom. Sylvie knew she was mean to mention Carmelo's name, but it was only weeks since his death, and Sabrina had sworn that she would never be interested in another man. Sylvie had to say something to get Sabrina's mind off telling Will about how Emma felt about him. Things like that should be left well alone. Emma opened the door of her house and was met by Growler. Hello, boy. What have you been up to? Emma was pleased that Growler was finally acknowledging her presence. She looked down at his paw and saw that it was healing over nicely. He probably knows I'm the one who feeds him, so he's realized he should be nice to me, Emma thought. Growler followed Emma to the kitchen, and Emma filled up his food and water bowl. Dorothy had not come home, and Emma still had no idea what to have for dinner. There was sure to be something in the cold box she could heat up. Feeling tired and stressed, Emma considered it was time to eat some chocolate to cheer herself up. 
She always kept a supply of milk chocolate, soft centers that she buys from the specialty chocolate shop in town. She put her head back into the couch, closed her eyes and popped a soft center pineapple chocolate into her mouth and let it melt slowly. Emma felt better now that she had shared how she felt about Will, but it did nothing to help her figure out what to do. Chapter 11 There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy, who art thou that judgest another? James chapter 4 verse 12 Will answered the knock on his front door and was surprised to see young Sabrina standing there. He looked past her to see if she had come with Emma or her sister, Sylvie. Sabrina, you're here alone? Sabrina nodded, and Will noticed that something with Sabrina was not right. Sabrina was normally smiling and happy. Knowing that it wouldn't be right to invite a young single woman into his house, even if it was very chilly out, he said, have a seat on the porch. Would you like some hot tea or something? Sabrina sat on the wooden porch seat after shaking her head in reference to the tea. Will sat in the chair beside her and rubbed his hands briskly together in an attempt to keep them warm. What brings you here? Everything's all right, isn't it? I've something to tell you, Sabrina said. Yeah. Will asked after she stopped and did not continue. It's about Emma. What about her? I've only just seen her drive past in her buggy, she's home, isn't she? I've overheard something. Will frowned. What is it? Sabrina's big blue eyes fastened onto him, and a frown lightly touched her forehead. Out with it, you're getting me worried. Sabrina took a deep breath. Okay, I'll just say it. Emma was talking to Sylvie earlier today, and I heard her say that she's not happy with you. Will gave a chuckle. I know, she's angry with me for making a mistake about a house I tried to buy. Don't worry, she'll be okay when she has had time to calm down. Sabrina turned her body to face him more directly. Nay, Will, you don't understand me. I'm saying that she said that she's having second thoughts about marrying you. Will shook his head. Sabrina, what you heard is women's talk, and you should not be repeating it. When you grow up you'll realize that when you repeat things you have heard, that you're creating trouble and spreading gossip. Will, I am grown, I'm nearing twenty. Sabrina stood up. Will ran a hand through his hair. Then you should know better. Don't you want to know what she's saying about you? Will shook his head slowly. Nay. Hey, it would be best if you go back home. Sabrina took a step toward him. What? I'm telling you that the woman that you're so in love with is not in love with you, and you blame me? That's all the thanks I get. I thought you'd want to know. Sabrina put her hands firmly to her hips. You should thank me. Will looked straight at Sabrina's buggy. See that buggy? Sabrina turned, looked at her buggy and said, Yeah. I want you to get in that buggy and go home right now. Will turned and went into his house and shut the door. Sabrina leaned close to the door and said in a loud voice, I also heard Emma say to Sylvie that Levi would never do all the stupid things that you do. He tried not to let Sabrina's words hurt him. He stood leaning against his front door and listened to Sabrina's footsteps as she stomped down the two steps of the porch. Finally he heard the clip-clop of horses' hooves heading back to the main road. He sank to the floor. He knew it was more than just women's talk. He could feel Emma slipping away from him, and that's what prompted him to try and buy the house. He wasn't stupid, he could see through Sabrina's flirting ways. He could smell the strong rose and vanilla scent she used in an effort to woo him. He knew why she was giving him information about Emma's lack of interest in him. It was clear to him that Sabrina liked him, he knew that from the first day that Sabrina arrived in Lancaster County. Will's thoughts turned to the old house he tried to buy. He could still buy the house if he sold his farm but then he would lose income, which he got from leasing the farm for crops. Alternatively, he could take out a loan against his farm, which is something he did not want to do. All the money he had inherited he'd loaned to people in the community, and he could not ask for it back. He might have to take out a loan anyway, to pay Emma back for the money she lost on supplies for the house renovations. He'd find a way to pay Emma back and now, he'd have to go and speak to her. If she was having second thoughts about marrying him, it's best that he find out sooner rather than later. He walked to her house and knocked on the door. Well, you don't usually knock. 
Emma looked into his face. What's wrong? You tell me, he said. Emma pulled slightly back away from him. What? We need to talk. Emma nodded. Come to the couch. As soon as they sat, Will said, I feel that things aren't the same between us lately. I have thought that you might be having some hesitations about marrying me. Before you answer, let me just say, I will pay you back every cent that you lost on the house. Once you sell all the materials you bought for the house, just pay me back half of what I lost. That way we both lose a little. Emma put her hand to her head and tried to work out whether what she had just said made sense. She realized it didn't but Will did not seem to notice so she kept quiet. Will lifted his hand. Nay, it was my silly decision, and I dragged you into it. I will pay back every dime. Now back to us. Tell me in all honesty how you are feeling about us. Emma took a deep breath. I'm feeling confused about whether we should get married. When did all this start? Will knew deep in his heart that it had started a while ago. I'm not sure. I feel in my heart I love you but I wonder whether we are a good match in a lot of ways. Will nodded. I understand. I don't like it, and I don't agree, but I understand. We can't get married if you feel like this. Tears started to brim in Emma's eyes. Will put his arm around her. I'll still look after you. We'll still be friends. Emma nodded. I know. It'll be hard to let go. They were silent for a moment. Will, why did you come over here all of a sudden to speak about this? Will pushed some strands of her dark blonde hair back beneath her prayer cap. He knew it would cause a lot of trouble between friends if he spoke of Sabrina's visit. I just thought it was the right time. I'll always love you, Will. And I will always love you. Will did not want Emma to see him cry. He looked at the low table in front of them and saw Emma's chocolates. I'll be going now so you can eat your chocolate in peace. I'll walk you out. Chapter 12 He that covereth a transgression seeketh love, but he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 9 After Emma closed the door on Will she felt sad, but at the same time she felt a weight had lifted off her. She knew that she had to make a decision, one way or the other. It wasn't so bad living alone especially since she had a lot of friends, and thanks to Growler, her fat tabby she was never truly alone. Emma lifted her face upward. Danka got for helping me through. She hoped that Will might tell the bishop of the cancellation. She knew people would talk and speculate on why they stopped their wedding but Emma did not care. No sooner had Will left her house than Dorothy came to the door. Dorothy, I've cooked dinner for us but after dinner do you mind if I pop out for a couple of hours tonight? I've got a meeting to go to, and I know you like to go to sleep early. Emma had the widow's meeting to go to that night, and she needed their support after everything she'd been through. I won't be staying. I've come to tell you that my son Harold is going to drive Harold and me all the way back to my home. My son Harold has offered me to stay at his place until Harold is ready to go to Florida. My son's picking me up in half an hour. Emma rushed to hug Dorothy. I'm so happy for you that you're with Harold finally. Do you need help to pack your things? I'd like it if you come up and talk to me while I pack. Of course. Emma followed Dorothy up the stairs. It might be confusing for you now with two Heralds. Dorothy laughed a little. Yes, it's already caused a bit of confusion. I was wondering if you and your friends might come to our wedding? I'd love to and I'm sure that they would too. Thank you. Dorothy sat on the bed and folded the few clothes that she had brought with her. I don't know how I can ever repay you and Maureen for what you've done. Emma sat down on the other side of the double bed and smiled. It was our pleasure, it was lovely to meet you and Harold and I'm glad you ended up back together. Remembering the detective's words, Emma said, I bet you were very angry with Josephine for lying to Harold about you being dead. The old lady looked at Emma. No, I'm not angry at all. Everyone gets what's coming to them eventually. I got my Harold back as I was meant to and Josephine, well, she got hers. Emma bit hard on her lip and then asked, What do you mean? 
Dorothy gave a bit of a chuckle. Well, she's not here anymore, is she? And what's more, her thick jet black hair that she was so proud of turned white and sparse she was nearly bald. Emma's blood ran cold. When did she see her last? Could she have been in that hospital room on the day she died? Could she have been the one to inject her with the fatal dose of insulin just as Detective Crowley suspected? Nay, she could have simply seen a photo. Not long after Emma carried Dorothy's two small bags downstairs, her son Harold called for her in his car. Emma hugged Dorothy goodbye and waved as she drove away. Emma sat on the couch and stroked Growler while she thought about what the detective had said. Could Dorothy have discovered Harold's whereabouts and waited for an opportunity for revenge? It did seem odd that she stopped checking for records of him. Did Dorothy deliberately leave the letters in the house so someone would reunite them? If she did cause Josephine's death, she would not have gone to Harold straight away. She would have been careful of her next move, particularly if she knew that there was a witness. If she did do it, Emma thought, what good would a life in jail do her? It's not as if she'd kill again. God is the one who gives the final judgment on the day of reckoning. Well, Growler will probably never know and sometimes that's the best way not to know. Growler looked at her and for the very first time since she had him, he purred. Later that night, Emma arrived at Elsa May and Eddie's house for the widow's meeting. After she tied her horse up, she waited for Sylvie who had just pulled up in her buggy. Emma, I'm glad. I can talk to you before you go in. What is it, Sylvie? Sabrina overheard you and me speaking. I told her not to mention any of our conversation to anyone. I'm hoping she'll never mention anything to Will. Emma held her stomach and wondered whether she might have already repeated it. Did she hear all of what we said? Sylvie nodded. I made her promise she would not say a word to anyone. Emma relaxed. That's good. I thought she was at work today. Sylvie rolled her eyes. My fault, I had the day wrong. Will and I are not going to get married now. Emma felt sick to the stomach at her own words. Sylvie caught Emma by the arm. What? Emma shook her head. I'll tell everyone tonight. Come on, they'll be waiting for us. Emma and Sylvie walked through Elsa May and Eddie's front door. Emma knew she would be able to think of little else the whole night, so once everyone was seated she blurted out her news. Will and I are not going ahead with the wedding. When the words came from her mouth, she wondered if maybe she had made a huge mistake. She longed to be held in Will's arms. Then she had to wonder, did she want only what she did not have? Emma looked at everyone in turn, and no one looked shocked. Well, isn't anyone going to say anything? Elsa May spoke. I think we saw it coming. Emma frowned. You did? I didn't see it coming. I think you did, Eddie said. Maureen patted Emma on the shoulder. It's best that you made that decision now. You're a long time married, you know. Emma smiled and remembered how Maureen and she hid on the train away from Maureen's ex-fiancé. I won't have to hide from him, though, Emma said with a laugh in her voice. Nay, you won't. Maureen chuckled and then told the other widows in on her ex-fiancé and how they hid from him on the train. Just as Maureen had finished her story, there was a knock on the door. Eddie got up to answer the door, and Elsa May leaned forward and whispered to the others, That'll be Crowley. Crowley walked in and nodded to the ladies, then sat on the only chair left in the room. Elsa May said, Emma is not getting married now. They've called the wedding off. Emma felt heat rise to her cheeks under the detective's gaze. She felt she should say something, but what could she say? She certainly did not owe anyone any explanation. Sadness over the loss of Will as a future husband tugged at her heart. If love was acceptance, should she have accepted Will just as he was? I'm sorry to hear that, Emma. The detective's response surprised Emma with its sincerity. More surprising than that was the softness of his words. Emma pressed her lips together and nodded her head in acknowledgement of his sympathy. I hope your grief didn't stop you from baking, did it, Emma? A laugh escaped her lips. She laughed at herself for thinking that there might be some softness about the detective, but his question proved he was totally insensitive. It did, actually. I brought nothing with me today. 
No chocolate chip cookies and no chocolate squares. I've got chocolate cake, detective. Eddie jumped to her feet and headed to the kitchen. I'll give you a hand, Eddie. Maureen rushed to help Eddie in the kitchen. The detective smiled and looked at Emma. Emma looked away from him and said, My visitor has left. She's staying at her son's place until Harold is ready, and then they are both going to live in Florida, and they are going to marry. That's lovely, Sylvie said. They were a lovely couple, Emma said. They were indeed, the detective said. Emma wondered whether the detective was being sarcastic, going by their earlier conversation regarding Dorothy. Elsa May placed a tray of cookies and cake in front of the detective. So, how exactly did Josephine, Harold's wife, die if I might ask? Emma held her breath, and her eyes fastened onto the detective. He had more or less told her that even if Dorothy were guilty, that there would not be enough evidence to convict her. Emma nibbled on a fingernail. The detective's theory was too far-fetched to be true. Surely, Josephine had been given insulin by one of the hospital staff in error. The detective reached for a cookie. Stopped breathing, he said as he bit into the cookie. Elsa May gave a disapproving grunt at Detective Crowley's answer, but kept quiet and picked up her knitting. Emma desperately hoped that no more would be said on the matter. Do you think it's odd that Dorothy never kept checking whether Harold had surfaced somewhere after the war? If she was so in love with him, it seems she gave up quite quickly, Elsa May said. Elsa May, you are seeing a murderer behind every tree. You really should stop being so suspicious of everyone, the detective said. Elsa May pursed her lips and her eyes fell to her knitting. Emma looked up at Detective Crowley and his hard features softened into a smile, and he gave her a wink. As Will walked back to his house from hearing the news that Emma did not want to marry him, he knew that he could not leave things there. He knew that Emma was the only one for him. Dear God, if it is your will I ask you in desperation to bring my Emma back to me. If there is a way, I ask that you point me to it. Denka, amen. Will was only at home for five minutes before his friend Smithy knocked on the door. Come in. It's not like you to visit. David and I heard that the house fell through, and we know that with all the money you've loaned people, it would have been more than enough for a deposit. Will scratched his eyebrow. I can't ask for it back. I've got four men organized to meet you at the bank at ten in the morning tomorrow. Altogether, there'll be forty-two thousand twenty dollars. That's your deposit right there. Can they afford it, Smithy? Do they still need it? It's all been taken care of. Don't forget, ten tomorrow. Smithy hit Will on the back of his shoulder, and got in his buggy and drove away. Denka got, I didn't expect such a fast answer. I can get the house back, and now I have to find a way to win Emma's heart. Will closed his door and went inside. He had to come up with a plan. Emma had always told him that he was too quick to jump into things. He would secure the house with a sizable deposit, and then he would tell Emma that they would have a fabulous life together. The old Will would have raced to Emma to tell her that they could still buy the house if she would have him back, but the new Will, the Will who thought things through would have everything in place before he spoke of it. The next day while Emma was fixing her midday meal, she was deep in thought about Will. She jumped when she heard a loud knock on her front door. When she opened the door, she was glad to see Will. Will, you don't normally knock, you usually walk straight in. Will ignored her comment. Emma, will you come somewhere with me? Where? I have a surprise for you. Emma frowned, and she knew by the look on Will's face that he was up to something. I don't know if my heart can take any more surprises. I think it will be able to take this one, I'm hoping anyway. Emma agreed and went with him in his buggy. After they had been driving for a while, Emma asked, Is this the way to the house we tried to buy? Will looked over at her, smiled and said, Nay. When they pulled up outside the old house, Emma frowned. Why did you bring me back here? You said we weren't coming here. As they sat in the buggy outside the house, Will was silent for a moment before he spoke. It's not the house we tried to buy, Emma. It's the house I've just bought. I've been able to put a sizable deposit on it. Emma put a fingernail to her mouth. But how? 
When he heard I couldn't raise money for the house without me knowing, Smithy rallied around and found the people I'd loaned money to, and most of them had money ready to repay. Emma opened her mouth to speak but Will raised his hand. Emma, I know I've been unreliable and I know that's not how a provider should be. I should never have taken a risk like I did with the house that first time. I give you my solemn word that I will be more practical, and I will even make plans. I'm asking you again to leave the past behind us. Emma, will you marry me? In that moment, Emma realized that she was at fault just as much as he. She was living in the past and expecting Will to be someone he was not. Will showed he could change and be more responsible, and if he could do that then she could be less rigid and live in the present. Emma nodded. Yeah, I will marry you. Will reached his arm around Emma and pulled her toward him. I've got enough money to give you back your contribution too. Nay, keep that, Will. Put it toward the house so I will feel a part of it. Will shook his head. You are a part of it, a part of everything I do from now on. And I give you my word that I will be responsible, I will talk things over with you and we will plan things together. I will be a strong and proper husband for you. Deep in her heart Emma felt secure and safe at last. She sniffed back her tears. I'm sorry Will that I called things off, I was confused it wasn't that I didn't love you. Will laughed. I'm glad you called it all off, Emma. It made me realize that I had to think of someone beyond myself. I had to grow up and become a better man. Emma was lightheaded and dizzy as Will pulled her toward him and touched his lips softly on hers. You have been listening to Amish House of Secrets. The next book in the Amish Secret Widows Society series is Book 6 Amish Undercover.